The Diary of a Madman by Guy de Maupassant. Read by Alan Davis Drake. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. He was dead. The head of a high tribunal, the upright magistrate, whose irreproachable life was a proverb in all the courts of France. Advocates, young counsellors, judges, had saluted, bowing low in token of profound respect, remembering that grand face, pale and thin, illuminated by two bright, deep-set eyes. He had passed his life in pursuing crime and in protecting the weak. Swindlers and murderers had no more redoubtable enemy for he seemed to read in the recesses of their souls their most secret thoughts. He was dead, now, at the age of eighty-two, honored by the homage and followed by the regrets of a whole people. Soldiers in red breeches had escorted him to the tomb, and men in white cravats had shed on his grave tears that seemed to be real. But, Listen to the strange paper found by the dismayed notary in the desk where the judge had kept filed the records of great criminals. It was titled, Why? June 20, 1851 I have just left court. I have condemned the Blondie to death. Now why did this man kill his five children? Frequently one meets with people to whom killing is a pleasure. Yes, yes, it should be a pleasure, the greatest of all, perhaps, for is not killing most like eating? To make and to destroy. These two words contain the history of the universe, the history of all worlds, all that is, all. Why is it not intoxicating to kill? June 25 to think that there is a being who lives who walks who runs a being what is a being an animated thing which bears in it the principle of motion and a will ruling that principle it clings to nothing this thing its feet are independent of the ground it is a grain of life that moves on the earth and this grain of life coming i know not whence one can destroy at one's will then nothing nothing more it perishes it is finished june twenty five why then is it a crime to kill yes why on the contrary it is the law of nature every being has the mission to kill he kills to live and he lives to kill the beast kills without ceasing, all day, every instant of its existence. Man kills without ceasing, to nourish himself, but since, in addition, he needs to kill for pleasure, he has invented the chase. The child kills the insects he finds, the little birds, all the little animals that come in his way. But this does not suffice for the irresistible need to massacre that is in us. It is not enough to kill beasts. We must kill man, too. Long ago this need was satisfied by human sacrifice. Now the necessity of living in society has made murder a crime. We condemn and punish the assassin. But as we cannot live without yielding to this natural and imperious instinct of death, we relieve ourselves from time to time by wars. Then a whole nation slaughters another nation. It is a feast that maddens armies and intoxicates the civilians, women, and children, who read, by lamplight, at night, the feverish story of massacre. And do we despise those picked out to accomplish these butcheries of men? No. They are loaded with honors. They are clad in gold and in resplendent stuffs. They wear plumes on their heads and ornaments on their breasts, and they are given crosses, rewards, titles of every kind. They are proud, respected, loved by women, cheered by the crowd, solely because their mission is to shed human blood. 
they drag through the streets their instruments of death and the passer-by clad in black looks on with envy for the kill is the great law put by nature in the heart of existence there is nothing more beautiful and honorable than killing june thirty to kill is the law because nature loves eternal youth she seems to cry in all her unconscious acts quick 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 the more she destroys the more she renews herself july three it must be a pleasure unique and full of zest to kill to place before you a living thinking being to make therein a little hole nothing but a little hole and to see the red liquid flow which is the blood which is the life and then to have before you only a heap of limp flesh cold void of thought august five i who have passed my life in judgment condemning killing by words pronounced killing by the guillotine those who had killed by the knife if i should do as all the assassins whom i have smitten have done i i who would know it august ten who would ever know who would ever suspect me especially if i should choose a being i had no interest in doing away with august twenty two i could resist no longer i have killed a little creature as an experiment as a beginning jean my servant had a goldfinch in a cage hung in the office window i sent him on an errand and i took the little bird in my hand in my hand where i felt its heart beat it was warm i went up to my room from time to time i squeezed it tighter its heart beat faster it was atrocious and delicious i was nearly choking it but i could not see the blood then i took scissors short nail scissors and i cut its throat in three strokes quite gently it opened its bill it struggled to escape me but i held it oh i held it i could have held a mad dog and i saw the blood trickle and then i did as assassins do real ones i washed the scissor and washed my hands i sprinkled water and took the body the corpse to the garden to hide it i buried it under a strawberry plant it will never be found every day i can eat a strawberry from that plant how one can enjoy life when one knows how my servant cried he thought his bird flown how could he suspect me ah august twenty five i must kill a man i must august thirty it is done but what a little thing i had gone for a walk in the forest of verne's I was thinking of nothing, literally nothing. See? A child on the road, a little child eating a slice of bread and butter. He stops to see me pass and says, Good day, Mr. President. And the thought enters my head, Shall I kill him? I answer, You are alone, boy? Yes, sir. All alone in the wood? Yes, sir. The wish to kill him intoxicated me like wine. I approached him quite softly, persuaded that he was going to run away. And suddenly I seized him by the throat. He held my wrists in his little hands, and his body writhed like a feather on the fire. Then he moved no more. I threw the body in the ditch, then some weeds on top of it. I returned home and dined well what a little thing it was in the evening i was very gay light rejuvenated and passed the evening at the prefects they found me witty but i have not seen blood i am not tranquil august thirty one the body has been discovered they are hunting for the assassin ah 
September 1. The tramps have been arrested. Proofs are lacking. September 2. The parents have been to see me. They wept. Ha! Huh. October 6. Nothing has been discovered. Some strolling vagabond must have done the job. Ah! If I had seen the blood flow, it seems to me I should be tranquil now. October 10. Yet another. I was walking by the river after breakfast, and I saw under a willow a fisherman asleep. A spade, as if expressly put there for me, was standing in a potato field nearby. I took it. I returned. I raised it like a club, and with one blow of the edge I cleft the fisherman's head. Oh, he bled this one, rose-colored blood. It flowed into the water quite gently, and I went away with a grave step. If I had been seen, ah, I should have made an excellent assassin. October 25. The affair of the fisherman makes a great noise. His nephew, who fished with him, is charged with the murder. October 26. The examining magistrate affirms that the nephew is guilty. Everybody in town believes it. Ah! Ah! October 27. The nephew defends himself badly. He had gone to the village to buy bread and cheese, he declares. He swears that his uncle had been killed in his absence. Who would have believed him? October 28. The nephew has all but confessed. So much have they made him lose his head. Ah! Justice! November 15. There are overwhelming proofs against the nephew, who was his uncle's heir. I shall preside at the sessions. January 25, 1852. To death, to death, to death. I have had him condemned to death. The Advocate General spoke like an angel. Ah, uh, yet another. I shall go to see him executed. March 10th. It is done. They guillotined him this morning. He died very well, very well. That gave me pleasure. How fine it is to see a man's head cut off. Now I shall wait. I can wait. It would take such a little thing to let myself be caught. The manuscript contains more pages, but told of no new crime. Alienist physicians to whom the awful story has been submitted declare that there are in this world many unknown madmen, as adroit and as terrible as this monstrous lunatic. End of The Diary of a Madman This recording is in the public domain. The Head Gardener's Story by Anton Chekhov Translated by Constance Garnett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Alan Davis Drake The Head Gardener's Story A sale of flowers was taking place at Count N.'s greenhouses. The purchasers were few in number. A landowner who was a neighbor of mine, a young timber merchant, and myself. While the workmen were carrying out our magnificent purchases and packing them into carts, we sat at the entry of the greenhouse and chatted about one thing or another. It was extremely pleasant to sit in a garden on a still April morning listening to birds and watching the flowers brought out into the open air and basking in the sunshine. The head gardener, Mikhail Karlovich, a venerable old man with a full-shaven face, wearing a fur waistcoat and no coat, superintended the packing of the plants himself, but at the same time he listened to our conversation in the hope of hearing something new. He was an intelligent, very good-hearted man, 
respected by everyone. He was, for some reason, looked upon by everyone as a German, though in reality on his father's side Swedish, on his mother's side Russian, and attended the Orthodox Church. He knew Russian, Swedish, and German. He had read a good deal in those languages, and nothing one could do gave him greater pleasure than lending him some new book or talking to him, for instance, about Ibsen. He had his weaknesses, but they were innocent ones. He called himself the head gardener, though there were no undergardeners. The expression of his face was usually dignified and haughty. He could not endure to be contradicted and liked to be listened to with respect and attention. "'That young fellow there I can recommend to you as an awful rascal,' said my neighbor, pointing to a laborer with a swarthy gypsy face, who drove by with a water-barrel. Last week he was tried in town for burglary, and was acquitted. They pronounced him mentally deranged, and yet look at him. He is the picture of health.' Scoundrels are very often acquitted nowadays in Russia, on grounds of abnormality and aberration. Yet these acquittals, these unmistakable proofs of an indulgent attitude to crime, lead to no good. They demoralize the masses. The sense of justice is blunted in all, as they become accustomed to seeing vice unpunished. And you know, in our age, one might boldly say in the words of Shakespeare, that in our evil and corrupt age, virtue must ask forgiveness of vice. That is very true, the merchant assented. Owing to these frequent acquittals, murder and arson have become much more common. Ask the peasants. Mikhail Karlovitch turned towards us and said, as far as I am concerned, gentlemen, I am always delighted to meet with these verdicts of not guilty. I am not afraid for morality and justice when they say not guilty. But on the contrary, I feel pleased. Even when my conscience tells me the jury have made a mistake in acquitting the criminal, even then I am triumphant. Judge for yourselves, gentlemen. If the judges and the jury have more faith in man than in evidence, material proofs, and speeches for the prosecution, is not that faith in man in itself higher than any ordinary considerations? Such faith is only attainable by those few who understand and feel Christ. A fine thought, I said. but not a new one. I remember a very long time ago I heard a legend on that subject. A very charming legend, said the gardener, and he smiled. I was told it by my grandmother, my father's mother, an excellent old lady. She told me it in Swedish, and it does not sound so fine, so classic in Russian. But we begged him to tell it, and not to be put off by the coarseness of the Russian language. Much gratified, he deliberately lighted his pipe, looked angrily at the laborers, and began. There settled in a certain little town a solitary plain elderly gentleman called Thompson, or Wilson. But that does not matter. The surname is not the point. He followed an honorable profession. He was a doctor. He was always morose and unsociable, and only spoke when required by his profession. He never visited anyone, never extended his acquaintance beyond a silent bow, and lived as humble as a hermit. The fact was, he was a learned man, and in those days learned men were not like other people. They spent their days and nights in contemplation, in reading and in healing disease looked upon everything else as trivial, and had no time to waste a word. The inhabitants of the town understood this, and tried not to worry him with their visits and empty chatter. They were very glad that God had sent them at last a man who could heal disease. 
and were proud that such a remarkable man was living in their town. He knows everything, they said about him. But that wasn't enough. They ought to have also said, He loves everyone. In the breast of that learned man there beat a wonderful angelic heart. Though the people of that town were strangers and not his own people, yet he loved them like children, and did not spare himself for them. He was himself ill with consumption, and had a cough. But when he was summoned to the sick, he forgot his own illness. He did not spare himself, and, gasping for breath, climbed up the hills, however high they might be. He disregarded the sultry heat and the cold, despised thirst and hunger. He would accept no money, and, strange to say, when one of his patients died, he would follow the coffin with the relations, weeping. And soon he became so necessary to the town that the inhabitants wondered how they could have got on before without the man. Their gratitude knew no bounds. Grown-up people and children, good and bad alike, honest men and cheats, all, in fact, respected him and knew his value. In the little town and all the surrounding neighborhood, there was no man who would allow himself to do anything disagreeable to him. Indeed, they would never have dreamed of it. When he came out of his lodgings, he never fastened the doors or windows, in complete confidence that there was no thief who could bring himself to do him wrong. He often had, in the course of his medical duties, to walk along the high roads, through the forests and mountains, haunted by numbers of hungry vagrants. But he felt that he was in perfect security. One night he was returning from a patient when robbers fell upon him in the forest. But when they recognized him, they took off their hats respectfully and offered him something to eat. When he answered that he was not hungry, they gave him a warm wrap and accompanied him as far as the town, happy that fate had given them the chance in some small way to show their gratitude to the benevolent man. Well, to be sure, my grandmother told me that even the horses and the cows and the dogs knew him, and expressed their joy when they met him. And this man, who seemed by his sanctity to have guarded himself from every evil, to whom even brigands and frenzied men wished nothing but good, was, one fine morning, found murdered. Covered with blood, with his skull broken, he was lying in a ravine, and his pale face wore an expression of amazement. Yes, not horror, but amazement was the emotion that had been fixed upon his face when he saw the murderer before him. You can imagine the grief that overwhelmed the inhabitants of the town and the surrounding districts. All were in despair, unable to believe their eyes, wondering who could have killed the man. The judges who conducted the inquiry and examined the doctor's body said, Here we have all the signs of a murder. But as there is not a man in the world capable of murdering our doctor, Obviously, it was not a case of murder, and the combination of evidence is due to simple cause. We must suppose that in the darkness he fell into the ravine of himself and was mortally injured. The whole town agreed with this opinion. The doctor was buried, and nothing more was said about a violent death. The existence of a man who could have the baseness and wickedness to kill the doctor seemed incredible. There is a limit even to wickedness, isn't there? All at once, would you believe it, chance led them to discover the murderer, a vagrant who had been many times convicted, notorious for his vicious life was seen selling for a drink a snuff-box and watch that had belonged to the doctor. When he was questioned he was confused, and answered with an obvious lie. A search was made, and in his bed was found a shirt with stains of blood on the sleeves, 
and a doctor's lancet set in gold. What more evidence was wanted? They put the criminal in prison. The inhabitants were indignant, and at the same time said, It's incredible. It can't be so. Take care that a mistake is not made. It does not happen, you know. That evidence tells a false tale. At his trial the murderer obstinately denied his guilt. Everything was against him, and to be convinced of his guilt was as easy as to believe that this earth is black. But the judges seemed to have gone mad. They weighed every proof ten times, looked distrustfully at the witnesses, flushed crimson, and sipped water. The trial began early in the morning and was only finished in the evening. The chief judge said, addressing the murderer, The court has found you guilty of murdering Dr. So-and-so, and has sentenced you to— The chief judge meant to say, to the death penalty, but he dropped from his hands the paper on which the sentence was written, wiped the cold sweat from his face, and cried out, No! May God punish me if I judged wrongly, but I swear he is not guilty. I cannot admit the thought that there exists a man who would dare to murder our friend the doctor. A man could not sink so low. There cannot be such a man, the other judges assented. No, the crowd cried. Let him go. The murderer was set free to go where he chose and not one soul blamed the court for an unjust verdict. And my grandmother used to say that for such faith in humanity God forgave the sins of all the inhabitants of that town. He rejoices when people believe that man in his image and semblance, and grieves if, forgetful of human dignity, they judge worse of men than dogs. The sentence of acquittal may bring harm to the inhabitants of the town, but on the other hand, think of the beneficial influence upon them, of that faith in man, a faith which does not remain dead. You know, it raises up generous feelings in us, and always impels us to love and respect every man, every man, and that is important. Mikhail Karlovich had finished. My neighbor would have urged some objection, but the head gardener made a gesture that signified that he did not like objections. Then he walked away to the carts, and, with an expression of dignity, went on looking after the packing. End of The Head Gardener's Story by Anton Chekhov this recording is in the public domain. How Ali Came to the Black Country by Lord Dunsany This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher How Ali Came to the Black Country by Lord Dunsany Sushan the barber went to Shep the maker of teeth to discuss the state of England. They agreed that it was time to send for Ali. So, Sushan stepped late that night from the little shop near Fleet Street, and made his way back again to his house in the ends of London, and sent at once the message that brought Ali. And Ali came, mostly on foot, from the country of Persia, and it took him a year to come, but when he came he was welcome. And Shep told Ali what was the matter with England, and Sushan swore that it was so. And Ali looking out of the window of the little shop near Fleet Street, beheld the ways of London, and audibly blessed King Solomon and his seal. When Shep and Shushan heard the names of King Solomon and his seal, both asked, as they had scarcely dared before, if Ali had it. Ali patted a little bundle of silks that he drew from his inner raiment. It was there. Now concerning the movements and courses of the stars, and the influence of them on the spirits of earth and devils, this age has been rightly named by some the Second Age of Ignorance. But Ali knew, and by watching nightly, for seven nights in Baghdad, the way of certain stars, he had found out the dwelling place of him they needed. Guided by Ali, all three set forth for the Midlands. 
and by the reverence that was manifest in the faces of Shep and Shushan towards the person of Ali, some knew what Ali carried, while others said that it was the tablets of the law, others the name of God, and others that he must have a lot of money about him. So they passed Slod and Apton. And at last they came to the town for which Ali sought, that spot over which he had seen the shy stars wheel and swerve away from their orbits, being troubled. Verily, when they came there were no stars, though it was midnight. And Ali said that it was the appointed place. In harems in Persia, in the evening when the tales go round, it is still told how Ali and Shep and Shushan came to the black country. When it was dawn, they looked upon the country and saw how it was without doubt the appointed place, even as Ali had said. For the earth had been taken out of pits and burned and left lying in heaps, and there were many factories, and they stood over the town that as it were rejoiced, and with one voice Shep and Shushan gave praise to Ali. And Ali said that the great ones of the place must needs be gathered together, and to this end Shep and Shushan went into the town and there spoke craftily. For they said that Ali had of his wisdom contrived as it were a patent and a novelty which should greatly benefit England. And when they heard how he sought nothing for his novelty, save only to benefit mankind, they consented to speak with Ali and see his novelty. And they came forth and met Ali. And Ali spake, and said unto them, O lords of this place, in the book that all men know, it is written how that a fisherman casting his net into the sea drew up a bottle of brass. And when he took the stopper from the bottle, a dreadful genie of horrible aspect rose from the bottle, as it were like a smoke, even to darkening the sky whereat the fishermen, and the great ones of the place said, We have heard this story. And Ali said, What became of that genie after he was safely thrown back into the sea is not properly spoken of by any, save those that peruse the study of demons, and not with certainty by any man. But that the stopper that bore the ineffable seal and bears it to this day became separate from the bottle, is among those things that man may know. And when there was doubt among the great ones, Ali drew forth his bundle, and one by one removed those many silks, till the seal stood revealed. And some of them knew it for the seal, and others knew it not. And they looked curiously at it, and listened to Ali. And Ali said, Having heard how evil is the case of England, how a smoke has darkened the country, and in places, as men say, the grass is black, and how even yet your factories multiply, and haste and noise have become such that men have no time for song, I have, therefore, come at the bidding of my good friend, Sushan, barber of London, and of Shep, a maker of teeth, to make things well with you. And they said, But where is your patent and your novelty? And Ali said, Have I not here the stopper, and on it, as good men know, the ineffable seal? Now I have learned in Persia how that your trains make haste, and hurry men to and fro, and your factories, and the digging of your pits, and all things that are evil, are every one of them caused and brought about by steam. Is it not so? said Shushan. It is even so said Shep. Now it is clear, said Ali, that the chief devil that vexes England has done all this harm, who herds men into cities, and will not let them rest, is even the devil's steam. Then the great ones would have rebuked him, but one said, No, let us hear him, perhaps his patent may improve on steam. And to them hearkening, Ali went on thus, O lords of this place, let there be made a bottle of strong steel, for I have no bottle with my stopper, and this being done, let all the factories, trains, digging of pits, and all evil things soever that may be done by steam, be stopped for seven days, and the men that tend them shall go free, but the steel bottle for my stopper I will leave open in a likely place. Now that chief devil steam, finding no factories to enter into, nor trains, sirens, nor pits prepared for him, and being curious and accustomed to steel pots, will verily enter one night into the bottle that you shall make for my stopper and I shall spring forth from my hiding with my stopper, and fasten him down with the ineffable seal, which is the seal of King Solomon, and deliver him up to you, that you cast him into the sea. And the great ones answered Ali, and they said, But what should we gain if we lose our prosperity, and be no longer rich? And Ali said, When we have cast this devil into the sea, there will come back again the woods and ferns and all the beautiful things that the world hath. The little leaping hare shall be seen at play. There shall be music on the hills again and that twilight ease in quiet, and after the twilight stars. And, verily, said Shushan, there shall be dance again. Aye, said Shep, there shall be the country dance. But the great one spake and said, denying Ali, We will make no such bottle for your stopper, nor stop our healthy factories our good trains, nor cease from our digging of pits, 
nor do anything that you desire, for an interference with steam would strike at the roots of that prosperity that you see so plentifully all around us. Thus they dismissed Ali there and then from that place where the earth was torn up and burnt, being taken out of pits, and where factories blazed all night with a demonic glare, and they dismissed with him both Shushan the barber and Shep the maker of teeth, so that a week later Ali started from Calais on his long walk back to Persia. And all this happened thirty years ago, and Shep is an old man now, and Shushan older, and many mouths have bit with the teeth of Shep, for he has a knack of getting them back whenever his customers die. And they have written again to Ali, away in the country of Persia, with these words, saying, O oh, Ali, the devil has indeed begotten the devil, even that spirit petrol. And the young devil waxeth, and increase in lusthood, and is ten years old and becoming like his father. Come, therefore, and help us with the ineffable seal, for there is none like Ali. And Ali turns where his slaves scatter rose leaves, letting the letter fall, and deeply draws from his hookah a puff of scented smoke right down to his lungs, and sighs it forth and smiles, and, lolling around on his other elbow, speaks comfortably and says, And shall a man go twice to the help of a dog? And with these words he thinks no more of England, but ponders again the inscrutable ways of God. End of How Ali Came to the Black Country The Mouse by Saki This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Christopher Hart on May 18, 2008, in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. The Mouse by Saki Theodoric Voller had been brought up from infancy to the confines of middle age, by a fond mother whose chief solicitude had been to keep him screened from what she called the coarser realities of life. When she died she left Theodoric alone in a world that was as real as ever, and a good deal closer than he considered it had any need to be. To a man of his temperament and upbringing, even a simple railway journey was crammed with petty annoyances and minor discords and as he settled himself down in a second-class compartment one September morning, he was conscious of ruffled feelings and general mental discomposure. He had been staying at a country vicarage, the inmates of which had been certainly neither brutal nor bacchanalian, but their supervision of the domestic establishment had been of that lax order which invites disaster. The pony carriage that was to take him to the station had never been properly ordered, and when the moment for his departure drew near, the handyman who should have produced the required article was nowhere to be found. In this emergency, Theodoric, to his mute but very intense disgust, found himself obliged to collaborate with the vicar's daughter in the task of harnessing the pony, which necessitated groping about in an ill-lighted outhouse called a stable, and smelling very like one, except in patches where it smelt of mice. Without being actually afraid of mice, Theodoric classed them among the coarser incidents of life and considered that Providence, with a little exercise of moral courage, might long ago have recognized that they were not indispensable, and have withdrawn them from circulation. As the train glided out of the station, Theodoric's nervous imagination accused himself of exhaling a weak odor of stable-yard, and possibly of displaying moldy straw or two on his usually well-brushed garments. Fortunately, the only other occupant of the compartment, a lady of about the same age as himself, seemed inclined for slumber rather than scrutiny. The train was not due to stop till the terminus was reached, in about an hour's time, and the carriage was of the old-fashioned sort that held no communication with the corridor, therefore no further travelling companions were likely to intrude on Theodoric's semi-privacy. And yet the train had scarcely attained its normal speed before he became reluctantly but vividly aware that he was not alone with the slumbering lady. He was not even alone in his own clothes. A warm, creeping movement over his flesh betrayed the unwelcome and highly resented presence, unseen but poignant, of a strayed mouse, that had evidently dashed into its present retreat during the episode of the pony harnessing. Furtive stamps and shakes and wildly directed pinches failed to dislodge the intruder, whose motto indeed seemed to be excelsior, and the lawful occupant of the clothes lay back against the cushions 
and endeavored rapidly to evolve some means for putting an end to the dual ownership. It was unthinkable that he should continue for the space of a whole hour in the horrible position of a routen house for vagrant mice. Already his imagination had at least doubled the numbers of the alien invasion. On the other hand, nothing less drastic than partial disrobing would ease him of his tormentor, and to undress in the presence of a lady, even for so laudable a purpose, was an idea that made his ear tips tingle in a blush of abject shame. He had never been able to bring himself even to the mild exposure of open work socks in the presence of the fair sex, and yet the lady in this case was to all appearances soundly and securely asleep. The mouse, on the other hand, seemed to be trying to crowd a wander jar into a few strenuous minutes. If there is any truth in the theory of transmigration, this particular mouse must certainly have been in a former state a member of the Alpine Club. Sometimes, in its eagerness, it lost its footing and slipped for half an inch or so, and then in fright, or more probably temper, it bit. Theodoric was goaded into the most audacious undertaking of his life, crimsoning to the hue of a beetroot, and keeping an agonized watch on his slumbering fellow traveler. He swiftly and noiselessly secured the ends of his railway rug to the racks on either side of the carriage, so that a substantial curtain hung athwart the compartment. In the narrow dressing room that he had thus improvised, he proceeded with violent haste to extricate himself partially and the mouse entirely from the surrounding casings of tweed and half wool. As the unraveled mouse gave a wild leap to the floor, the rug, slipping its fastening at either end, also came down with a heart curdling flop, and almost simultaneously the awakened sleeper opened her eyes. With a movement almost quicker than the mouse's, Theodoric pounced on the rug and hauled its ample folds chin-high over his dismantled person as he collapsed into the further corner of the carriage. The blood raced and beat in the veins of his neck and forehead, while he waited dumbly for the communication cord to be pulled. The lady, however, contented herself with a silent stare at her strangely muffled companion. How much had she seen, Theodoric queried to himself, and in any case, what on earth must she think of his present posture? I think I have caught a chill, he ventured desperately. Really, I'm sorry, she replied. I was just going to ask you if you would open this window. I fancy it's malaria, he added, his teeth chattering slightly, as much from fright as from a desire to support his theory. I've got some brandy in my hold all, if you'll kindly reach it down for me, said his companion. Not for worlds. I mean, I never take anything for it, he assured her earnestly. I suppose you caught it in the tropics. Theodoric, whose acquaintance with the tropics was limited to an annual present of a chest of tea from an uncle in Ceylon, felt that even the malaria was slipping from him. Would it be possible, he wondered, to disclose the real state of affairs to her in small installments? Are you afraid of mice, he ventured, growing, if possible, more scarlet in the face? Not unless they came in quantities, like those that ate at Bishop Hatto. Why do you ask? I had one crawling inside my clothes just now, said Theodoric, in a voice that hardly seemed his own. It was a most awkward situation. It must have been, if you wear your clothes at all tight, she observed but mice have strange ideas of comfort. I had to get rid of it while you were asleep, he continued. Then, with a gulp, he added, It was getting rid of it that brought me to, to this. Surely leaving off one small mouse wouldn't bring on a chill, she exclaimed, with a levity that Theodoric accounted abominable. Evidently she had detected something of his predicament, and was enjoying his confusion. All the blood in his body seemed to have mobilized in one concentrated blush, and an agony of abasement, worse than a myriad mice, crept up and down over his soul. And then, as reflection began to assert itself, sheer terror took the place of humiliation. With every minute that passed, the train was rushing nearer to the crowded and bustling terminus, where dozens of prying eyes would be exchanged for the one paralyzing pair that watched him from the further corner of the carriage. There was one slender, despairing chance, which the next few minutes must decide. His fellow traveller might relapse into a blessed slumber, but as the minutes throbbed by that chance ebbed away. The furtive glance which Theodoric stole at her from time to time disclosed only an unwinking wakefulness. I think we must be getting near now, she presently observed. Theodoric had already noted, with growing terror, the recurring stacks of small, ugly dwellings that heralded the journey's end. The words acted as a signal like a hunted beast breaking cover and dashing madly towards some other haven of momentary safety he threw aside his rug and struggled frantically into his disheveled garments he was conscious of dull suburban stations racing past the window 
of a choking, hammering sensation in his throat and heart, and of an icy silence in that corner towards which he dared not look. Then, as he sank back in his seat, clothed and almost delirious, the train slowed down to a final crawl, and the woman spoke. "'Would you be so kind,' she asked, "'as to get me a porter to put me into a cab? "'It's a shame to trouble you when you're feeling unwell, "'but being blind makes one so helpless at a railway station.'" End of The Mouse by Saki The One Million Pound Banknote by Mark Twain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter David Smith The One Million Pound Banknote by Mark Twain When I was 27 years old, I was a mining broker's clerk in San Francisco and an expert on all the details of stock traffic. I was alone in the world and had nothing to depend upon but my wits and a clean reputation. But these were setting my feet in the road to eventual fortune, and I was content with the prospect. My time was my own after the afternoon board Saturdays, and I was accustomed to put it in on a little sailboat on the bay. One day I ventured too far and was carried out to sea. Just at nightfall, when hope was about gone, I was picked up by a small brig which was bound for London. It was a long and stormy voyage, and they made me work my passage without pay as a common sailor. When I stepped ashore in London, my clothes were ragged and shabby, and I had only a dollar in my pocket. This money fed and sheltered me twenty-four hours. During the next twenty-four, I went without food and shelter. About ten o'clock on the following morning, seedy and hungry, I was dragging myself along Portland Place when a child that was passing, towed by a nursemaid, tossed a luscious big pear, minus one bite, into the gutter. I stopped, of course, and fastened my desiring eye on that muddy treasure. My mouth watered for it. My stomach craved it. My whole being begged for it. But every time I made a move to get it, some passing eye detected my purpose, and of course I straightened up then and looked indifferent and pretended I hadn't been thinking about the pear at all. This same thing kept happening and happening, and I couldn't get the pear. I was just getting desperate enough to brave all the shame and to seize it, when a window behind me was raised and a gentleman spoke out of it, saying, Step in here, please. I was admitted by a gorgeous flunkey and shown into a sumptuous room where a couple of elderly gentlemen were sitting. They sent away the servant and made me sit down. They had just finished their breakfast, and the sight of the remains of it almost overpowered me. I could hardly keep my wits together in the presence of that food. But as I was not asked to sample it, I had to bear my trouble as best I could. Now something had been happening there a little before, which I did not know anything about until a good many days afterwards. But I will tell you about it now. Those two old brothers had been having a pretty hot argument a couple of days before and it ended by agreeing to decide it by a bet, which is the English way of settling everything. You will remember that the Bank of England once issued two notes of a million pounds each to be used for a special purpose connected with some public transaction with a foreign country. For some reason or other, only one of those had been used and cancelled. The other still lay in the vaults of the bank. Well, the brothers, chatting along, happened to get to wondering what might be the fate of a perfectly honest and intelligent stranger who should be turned adrift in London without a friend and with no money but that million-pound banknote, and no way to account for his being in possession of it. Brother A said he would starve to death, and Brother B said he wouldn't. Brother A said he couldn't offer it 
at a bank or anywhere else, because he would be arrested on the spot. So they went on disputing till Brother B said he would bet twenty thousand pounds that the man would live thirty days anyway on that million and keep out of jail too. Brother A took him up. Brother B went down to the bank and bought that note. Just like an Englishman, you see, plucked to the backbone. Then he dictated a letter which one of his clerks wrote out in a beautiful round hand. And then the two brothers sat at the window a whole day, watching for the right man to give it to. They saw many honest faces go by that were not intelligent enough, many that were intelligent but not honest enough, many that were both, but the possessors were not poor enough, or if poor enough, were not strangers. There was always a defect until I came along, but they agreed that I filled the bill all around. So they elected me unanimously, and there I was now, waiting to know why I was called in. They began to ask me questions about myself, and pretty soon they had my story. Finally, they told me I would answer their purpose. I said I was sincerely glad, and asked what it was. Then one of them handed me an envelope, and said I would find the explanation inside. I was going to open it, but he said no. Take it to my lodgings and look it over carefully and not be hasty or rash. I was puzzled and wanted to discuss the matter a little further, but they didn't. So I took my leave, feeling hurt and insulted to be made the butt of what was apparently some kind of a practical joke, and yet obliged to put up with it, not being in circumstances to resent affronts from rich and strong folk, I would have picked up the pear now and eaten it before all the world, but it was gone. So I had lost that by this unlucky business, and the thought of it did not soften my feeling towards those men. As soon as I was out of sight of that house, I opened my envelope and saw that it contained money. My opinion of those people changed, I can tell you. I lost not a moment, but shoved note and money into my vest pocket and broke for the nearest cheap eating house. Well, how I did eat. When at last I couldn't hold any more, I took out my money and unfolded it, took one glimpse and nearly fainted. Five millions of dollars. Why, well, it made my head swim. I must have sat there stunned and blinking at the note as much as a minute before I came rightly to myself again. The first thing I noticed then was the landlord. His eye was on the note, and he was petrified. He was worshipping with all his body and soul, but he looked as if he couldn't stir hand or foot. I took my cue in a moment and did the only rational thing there was to do. I reached the note towards him and said carelessly, Give me the change, please. Then he was restored to his normal condition and made a thousand apologies for not being able to break the bill, and I couldn't get him to touch it. He wanted to look at it and keep on looking at it. He couldn't seem to get enough of it to quench the thirst of his eye but he shrank from touching it as if it had been something too sacred for poor common clay to handle. I said, I am sorry if it's an inconvenience, but I must insist. Please change it. I haven't anything else. But he said that wasn't any matter, and he was quite willing to let the trifle stand over until another time. I said I might not be in his neighborhood again for a good while, but he said it was of no consequence he could wait, and, moreover, I could have anything I wanted, any time I chose, and let the account run as long as I pleased. He said he hoped he wasn't afraid to trust as rich a gentleman as I was, merely because I was of a merry disposition, and chose to play locks on the public in the matter of dress. By this time, another customer was entering, and the landlord hinted to me to put the monster out of sight. Then he bowed me all the way to the door, and I started straight for that house and those brothers to correct the mistake which had been made before the police should hunt me up and help me do it. 
I was pretty nervous, in fact, pretty badly frightened, though of course I was no way in fault. But I knew men well enough to know that when they find they've given a tramp a million-pound bill, when they thought it was a one-pounder, they are in a frantic rage against him instead of quarrelling with their own nearsightedness, as they ought. As I approached the house, my excitement began to abate, for all was quiet there, which made me feel pretty sure the blunder was not discovered yet. I rang. The same servant appeared. I asked for those gentlemen. They are gone, this in the lofty, cold way of that fellow's tribe. Gone? Gone where? On a journey. But whereabouts? To the continent, I think. The continent? Yes, sir. Which way? By, by what route? I can't say, sir. When will they be back? In a month, they said. A month? Oh, th this is awful. Give me some sort of idea how to get a word to them. It's of the last importance. I can't, sir. I've no idea where they've gone, sir. Then I must see some member of the family. Family's away, too. Been abroad months, in Egypt and India, I think. Man, there's been an immense mistake made. They'll be back before night. Will you tell them I've been here and that I will keep coming till it's all made right and they needn't be afraid? I'll tell them if they come back, but I am not expecting them. They said you would be here in an hour to make inquiries, but I must tell you it's all right. They'll be here on time and expect you. So I had to give it up and go away. What a riddle it all was. I was like to lose my mind. They would be here on time. What could that mean? Oh, the letter would explain, maybe. I'd forgotten the letter. I got it out and read it. This is what it said. You are an intelligent and honest man, as one may see by your face. We conceive you to be poor and a stranger. Enclosed you will find a sum of money. It is lent to you for thirty days without interest. Report at this house at the end of that time. I have a bet on you. If I win it, you shall have any situation that is in my gift, any that is that you shall be able to prove yourself familiar with and competent to fill. No signature, no address, no date. Well, here was a coil to be in. You were posted on what had preceded all this, but I was not. It was just a deep, dark puzzle to me. I hadn't the least idea what the game was, nor whether harm was meant to me or a kindness. I went into a park and sat down to try to think it out and to consider what I had best do. At the end of an hour, my reasonings had crystallized into this verdict. Maybe those men mean me well, maybe they mean me ill. No way to decide that. Let it go. They've got a game or a scheme or an experiment of some kind on hand. No way to determine what it is. Let it go. There's a bet on me. No way to find out what it is. Let it go. That disposes of the indeterminable quantities. The remainder of the matter is tangible, solid, and may be classed and labelled with certainty. If I ask the Bank of England to place this bill to the credit of the man it belongs to, they'll do it, for they know him, although I don't. But they will ask me how I came in possession of it, and if I tell the truth, they'll put me in the asylum, naturally, and a lie will land me in jail. The same result would follow if I tried to bank the bill anywhere or to borrow money on it. I have got to carry this immense burden around until those men come back, whether I want to or not. It is useless to me, as useless as a handful of ashes, and yet I must take care of it and watch over it while I beg my living. I couldn't give it away if I should try, for neither honest citizen nor highwayman would accept it or meddle with it for anything. 
those brothers are safe. Even if I lose their bill or burn it, they are still safe, because they can stop payment and the bank will make them whole. But meantime, I've got to do a month's suffering without wages or profit, unless I help win that bet, whatever it may be, and get that situation that I am promised. I should like to get that. Men of their sort have situations in their gift that are worth having. I got to thinking a good deal about that situation. My hopes began to rise high. Without doubt, the salary would be large. It would begin in a month. After that, I should be all right. Pretty soon, I was feeling first rate. By this time, I was tramping the streets again. The sight of a tailor's shop gave me a sharp longing to shed my rags and to clothe myself decently once more. Could I afford it? No. I had nothing in the world but a million pounds. So I forced myself to go on by. But soon I was drifting back again. The temptation persecuted me cruelly. I must have passed that shop back and forth six times during that manful struggle. At last, I gave in. I had to. I asked if they had a misfit suit that had been thrown on their hands. The fellow I spoke to nodded his head towards another fellow and gave me no answer. I went to the indicated fellow, and he indicated another fellow with his head, and no words. I went to him, and he said, Turn to you presently. I waited till he was done with what he was at. Then he took me into a back room and overhauled a pile of rejected suits and selected the rattiest one for me. I put it on. It didn't fit and wasn't in any way attractive, but it was new, and I was anxious to have it. So I didn't find any fault, but I said with some diffidence... It would be an accommodation to me if you could wait some days for the money. I haven't any small change about me. The fellow worked up a most sarcastic expression of countenance and said, Oh, you haven't. Well, of course. I didn't expect it. I'd only expect gentlemen like you to carry large change. I was nettled and said, My friend... You shouldn't judge a stranger always by the clothes he wears. I am quite able to pay for this suit. I simply didn't wish to put you to the trouble of changing a large note. He modified his style a little at that and said, though still with something of an air, I didn't mean any particular harm, but as long as rebukes are going, I might say, it wasn't quite your affair to jump to the conclusion that we couldn't change any note you might happen to be carrying around. On the contrary, we can. I handed the note to him and said, Oh, very well, I apologize. He received it with a smile. One of those large smiles which goes all around over and has folds in it and wrinkles and spirals and looks like the place where you've thrown a brick in a pond. And then, in the act of his taking a glimpse of the bill, this smile froze solid and turned yellow and looked like those wavy, wormy spreads of lava you find hardened on little levels on the side of Vesuvius. I never before saw a smile caught like that and perpetuated. The man stood there holding the bill and looking like that, and the proprietor hustled up to see what was the matter and said briskly, well, what's up? What's the trouble? What's wanting? I said, there isn't any trouble. I'm waiting for my change. Come, come. Get him his change, Todd. Get him his change. Todd retorted, get him his change? It's easy to say, sir, but look at the bill yourself. The proprietor took a look 
gave a low, eloquent whistle, and then made a dive for the pile of rejected clothing and began to snatch it this way and that, talking all the time, excitedly and as if to himself. Sell an eccentric millionaire such an unspeakable suit as that? Todd's a fool, a born fool, always doing something like this drives every millionaire away from the place because he can't tell a millionaire from a tramp and never could ah there's the thing i'm after please get those things off sir and throw them in the fire do me the favour to put on this shirt and this suit it's just the thing the very thing plain rich modest and just ducally knobby made to order for a prince you may know him sir his serene highness the hospodar of halifax had to leave it with us and take a morning suit because his mother was going to die, which she didn't. But that's all right. We can't always have things the way we... Um, that, that is the way they... There! Trousers all right? They fit you to a charm, sir. Now the waistcoat. Aha! Uh -huh. Right again. Now the coat. Lord, look at that now. Perfect! The whole thing. I never saw such a triumph in all my experience. I express my satisfaction. Quite right, sir, quite right. It'll do for a makeshift, I'm bound to say. But wait till you see what we'll get up for you on your own measure. Come, Todd, book and pen, get at it, length of leg thirty-two. And so on. Before I could get in a word, he had measured me, and was giving orders for dress suits, morning suits, shirts, and all sorts of things. When I got a chance, I said, But, my dear sir, I can't give these orders unless you can wait indefinitely or change the bill. Indefinitely! It's a weak word, sir, a weak word. Eternally, that's the word, sir. Todd, rush these things through, and send them to the gentleman's address without any waste of time. Let the minor customers wait. Set down the gentleman's address, and I'm changing my quarters. I will drop in and leave the new address. Quite right, sir, quite right. One moment. Let me show you out, sir. There, good day, sir, good day. Well... Don't you see what was bound to happen? I drifted naturally into buying whatever I wanted and asking for change. Within a week I was sumptuously equipped with all needful comforts and luxuries and was housed in an expensive private hotel in Hanover Square. I took my dinners there, but for breakfast I stuck by Harris's humble feeding house, where I'd got my first meal on my million-pound bill. I was the making of Harris. The fact had gone all abroad that the foreign crank who carried million-pound bills in his vest pocket was the patron saint of the place. That was enough from being a poor, struggling, little hand-to-mouth enterprise it had become celebrated and overcrowded with customers. Harris was so grateful that he forced loans upon me and would not be denied, and so Pauper as I was, I had money to spend and was living like the rich and the great. I judged that there was going to be a crash by and by, but I was in now and must swim across or drown. You see, there was just that element of impending disaster to give a serious side, a sober side, yes, a tragic side, to a state of things which would otherwise have been purely ridiculous. In the night, in the dark, the tragedy part was always to the front, and always warning, always threatening, and so I moaned and tossed, and sleep was hard to find. But in the cheerful daylight, the tragedy element faded out and disappeared, and I walked on air and was happy to giddiness, to intoxication, you may say. And it was natural for I had become one of the notorieties of the metropolis of the world, and it turned my head, not just a little, but a good deal. You could not take up a newspaper, English, Scotch, or Irish, without finding in it one or more references to the vest pocket million pounder and his latest doings and sayings. At first, in these mentions, I was at the bottom of the personal gossip column, Next, I was listed above the knights. Next, above the baronets. Next, above the barons. And so on and so on, climbing steadily. As my notoriety augmented, until I reached the highest altitude possible, and there I remained, taking precedences of all dukes not royal, 
and of all ecclesiastics except the primate of all England. But mind, this was not fame. As yet, I had achieved only notoriety. Then came the climaxing stroke, the accolade, so to speak, which in a single instance transmuted the perishable dross of notoriety into the enduring gold of fame. Punch caricatured me. Yes, I was a made man now. My place was established. I might be joked about still, but reverently, not bilariously, not rudely. I could be smiled at, but not laughed at. The time for that had gone by. Punch pictured me all a flutter with rags, dickering with a beef-eater for the Tower of London. Well, you can imagine how it was with a young fellow who had never been taken notice of before, and now all of a sudden couldn't say a thing that wasn't taken up and repeated everywhere, couldn't stir abroad without constantly overhearing the remark flying from lip to lip. There he goes! That's him! Couldn't take his breakfast without a crowd to look on. Couldn't appear in an opera box without concentrating there the fire of a thousand lorgnettes. Why, I just swam in glory all day long. That's the amount of it. You know, I even kept my old suit of rags and every now and then appeared in them so as to have the old pleasure of buying trifles and being insulted and then shooting the scoffer dead with the million-pound bill. But I couldn't keep that up. The illustrated papers made the outfit so familiar that when I went out in it, I was at once recognized and followed by a crowd, and if I attempted a purchase, the man would offer me his whole shop on credit before I could pull my note on him. About the tenth day of my fame, I went to fulfill my duty to my flag by paying my respects to the American minister. He received me with the enthusiasm proper in my case, upbraided me for being so tardy in my duty, and said that there was only one way to get his forgiveness, and that was to take the seat at his dinner party that night made vacant by the illness of one of his guests. I said I would, and we got to talking. It turned out that he and my father had been schoolmates in boyhood, Yale students together later, I'd always warm friends up to my father's death. So then he required me to put in at his house all the odd time I might have to spare. And I was very willing, of course. In fact, I was more than willing. I was glad. When the crash should come, he might somehow be able to save me from total destruction. I didn't know how, but he might think of a way, maybe. I couldn't venture to unbosom myself to him at this late date. A thing which I would have been quick to do in the beginning of this awful career of mine in London. No, I couldn't venture it now. I was in too deep. That is too deep for me to be risking revelations to so new a friend, though not clear beyond my depth as I looked at it. Because, you see, with all my borrowing, I was carefully keeping within my means. I mean, within my salary. Of course, I couldn't know what my salary was going to be, but I had a good enough basis for an estimate in the fact that if I won the bet... I was to have choice of any situation that was in that rich old gentleman's gift, provided I was competent. And I should certainly prove competent. I hadn't any doubt about that. And as to the bet, I wasn't worrying about that. I had always been lucky. Now, my estimate of the salary was 600 to 1,000 a year. Say 600 for the first year, and so on, up year by year, till I struck the upper figure by proved merit. At present, I was only in debt for my first year's salary. Everybody had been trying to lend me money, but I had fought off the most of them on one pretext or another. So this indebtedness represented only £300 borrowed money. The other £300 represented my keep and my purchases. I believed my second year's salary would carry me through the rest of the month if I went on being cautious and economical. And I intended to look sharply out for that. My month ended, my employer back from his journey, I should be all right once more, for I should at once divide the two years' salary among my creditors by assignment and get right down to my work. It was a lovely dinner party of fourteen. 
the Duke and Duchess of Shoreditch, and their daughter, the Lady Anne, Grace, Eleanor, Celeste, and so forth, and so forth, de Bohun, the Earl and Countess of Newgate, Viscount Cheapside, Lord and Lady Blatherskite, some untitled people of both sexes, the minister and his wife and daughter, and his daughter's visiting friend, an English girl of twenty-two named Portia Langham, whom I fell in love with in two minutes, and she with me. I could see that without glasses. There was still another guest, an American. But I'm a little ahead of my story. While the people were still in the drawing room, wetting up for dinner and coldly inspecting the latecomers, the servant announced, Mr. Lloyd Hastings. The moment the usual civilities were over, Hastings caught sight of me and came straight with cordially outstretched hand, then stopped short when about to shake and said with an embarrassed look, I beg your pardon, sir. I thought I knew you. Why, you do know me, old fellow. No. Are you the... the... The vest pocket monster? I am indeed. Don't be afraid to call me by my nickname. I'm used to it. Well, 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 this is a surprise. Once or twice I've seen your own name coupled with the nickname, but it never occurred to me that you could be the Henry Adams referred to. Why, it isn't six months since you were clerking away for Blake Hopkins in Frisco on a salary and sitting up nights on an extra allowance helping me arrange and verify Gould and Curry extension papers and statistics. The idea of your being in London and a vast millionaire and a colossal celebrity. Why, it's the Arabian Nights come again. Man, I can't take it in at all. Can't realize it. Give me time to settle the world in my head. Fact is, Lloyd, you are no worse off than I am. I can't realize it myself. Dear me, it is stunning now, isn't it? Why, it's just three months today since we went to the miners' restaurant. No, the what cheer? Right, right, it was the what cheer. Went there at two in the morning and had a chop and coffee after a hard six hours grind over those extension papers and I tried to persuade you to come to London with me and offered to get leave of absence for you and pay all your expenses and give you something over if I succeeded in making the sale, and you would not listen to me, said I wouldn't succeed and you couldn't afford to lose the run of business and be no end of time getting the hang of things again when you got back home. And yet here you are. How odd it all is. How did you happen to come? Whatever did give you this incredible start? Oh, just an accident. It's a long story, a romance, a body might say. I'll tell you all about it, but not now. When? The end of the month. That's more than a fortnight yet. It's too much of a strain on a person's curiosity. Make it a week. I can't. You'll know why by and by. But how's the trade getting along? His cheerfulness vanished like a breath, and he said with a sigh, You were a true prophet, Hal, a true prophet. I wish I hadn't come. I don't want to talk about it. But you must. You must come and stop with me tonight when we leave here and tell me all about it. Oh, may I? Are you in earnest? and the water showed in his eyes. Yes, I want to hear the whole story, every word. I'm so grateful, just to find a human interest once more, in some voice and in some eye, in me, and affairs of mine, after what I've been through here, Lord. I could go down on my knees for it. He gripped my hand hard and braced up, and was all right and lively after that for the dinner, which didn't come off. No, the usual thing happened, the thing that is always happening under that vicious and aggravating English system. The matter of precedence couldn't be settled, and so there was no dinner. Englishmen always eat dinner before they go out to dinner, because they know the risks they are running. But nobody ever warns the stranger, and so he walks placidly into the trap. Of course, 
nobody was hurt this time, because we had all been to dinner, none of us being novices except Hastings, and he having been informed by the minister at the time that he invited him that in deference to the English custom he had not provided any dinner. Everybody took a lady in procession down to the dining room because it is usual to go through the motions. But there the dispute began. The Duke of Shoreditch wanted to take precedence and sit at the head of the table, holding that he outranked a minister who represented merely a nation and not a monarch. But I stood for my rights and refused to yield. In the gossip column, I ranked all dukes not royal and said so and claimed precedence of this one. It couldn't be settled, of course. Struggle as we might, and did, he finally and injudiciously trying to play birth and antiquity, and I, seeing his conqueror and raising him with Adam, whose direct posterity I was, as shown by my name, while he was of a collateral branch, as shown by his and his recent Norman origin. So we all processioned back to the drawing-room again and had a perpendicular lunch, a plate of sardines and a strawberry, and you group yourself and stand up and eat it. Here the religion of precedence is not so strenuous. The two persons of highest rank chuck up a shilling, and the one that wins has first go at his strawberry, and the loser gets the shilling. The next two chuck up, and then the next two, and so on. After refreshment, tables were brought, and we all played cribbage, sixpence a game. The English never play any game for amusement. If they can't make something or lose something, they don't care which, they won't play. We had a lovely time, certainly two of us had, Miss Langham and I. I was so bewitched with her that I couldn't count my hands if they went above a double sequence. And when I struck home, I never discovered it and started up the outside row again and would have lost the game every time. Only the girl did the same, she being in just my condition, you see. And consequently, neither of us ever got out or cared to wonder why we didn't. We only just knew we were happy and didn't wish to know anything else and didn't want to be interrupted. And I told her. I did indeed. Told her I loved her. And she, well, she blushed till her hair turned red, but she liked it. She said she did. Oh, there was never such an evening. Every time I pegged, I put on a postscript. Every time she pegged, she acknowledged receipt of it, counting the hands the same. Why, I couldn't even say, two for his heels, without adding, my, how sweet you do look. And she would say, Fifteen two, fifteen four, fifteen six, and a pair are eight, and eight are sixteen. Do you think so? Weeping out a slant from under her lashes, you know, so sweet and cunning. Oh, it was just too, too. Well, I was perfectly honest and square with her. I told her I hadn't a cent in the world, but just the million-pound note she'd heard so much about, and it didn't belong to me. And that started her curiosity, and then I talked low and told her the whole history right from the start, and it nearly killed her laughing. What in the nation she could find to laugh about, I couldn't see. But there it was, every half minute some new detail would fetch her, and I would have to stop as much as a minute and a half to give her a chance to settle down again. Why, she laughed herself lame, she did indeed. I never saw her anything like it. I mean, I never saw a painful story, a story of a man's troubles and worries and fears, produce just that kind of effect before. So I loved her all the more, seeing she could be cheerful when there wasn't anything to be cheerful about, for I might soon need that kind of a wife, you know, the way things looked. Of course, I told her we should have to wait a couple of years till I could catch up on my salary, but she didn't mind that, only she hoped... I would be as careful as possible in the matter of expenses and not let them run the least risk of trenching on our third year's pay. Then she began to get a little worried and wondered if we were making any mistake and starting the salary on a higher figure for the first year than I would get. This was good sense and it made me feel a little less confident than I had been feeling before, but it gave me a good business idea and I brought it frankly out. Poor dear. 
Would you mind going with me that day when I confront those old gentlemen? She shrank a little, but said, No, if my being with you would help hearten you. But would it be quite proper, do you think? No, I don't know that it would. In fact, I'm afraid it wouldn't. But you see, there's so much dependent upon it that then I'll go anyway, proper or improper, she said, with a beautiful and generous enthusiasm. Oh, I shall be so happy to think I'm helping. Helping, dear? Why, you'll be doing it all. You're so beautiful, so lovely, and so winning, that with you there I can pile our salary up till I break those good old fellows and they'll never have the heart to struggle. So, you should have seen the rich blood mount and her happy eyes shine. You wicked flatterer. There isn't a word of truth in what you say, but I'll still go with you. Maybe it will teach you not to expect other people to look with your eyes. Were my doubts dissipated? Was my confidence restored? You may judge by this fact. Privately, I raised my salary to 1200 the first year on the spot, but I didn't tell her. I saved it for a surprise. All the way home, I was in the clouds, Hastings talking, I not hearing a word. When he and I entered my parlor, he brought me to myself with his fervent appreciations of my manifold comforts and luxuries. Let me just stand here a little and look my fill. Dear me, it's a palace, it's just a palace, and in it everything a body could desire, including cozy coal fire and supper standing ready. Henry, it doesn't merely make me realize how rich you are, it makes me realize to the bone, to the marrow, how poor I am. How poor I am, and how miserable, how defiant. Defeated, routed, annihilated. Plague take it, this language gave me the cold shudders. It scared me broad awake and made me comprehend that I was standing on a half-inch crust with a crater beneath. I didn't know I had been dreaming. That is, I hadn't been allowing myself to know it for a while back. But now, oh dear... Deep in debt, not a cent in the world, a lovely girl's happiness or woe in my hands, and nothing in front of me but a salary which might never, oh, would never materialize. Oh, 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 I am ruined past hope. Nothing can save me. Henry, the mere unconsidered drippings of your daily income would... Oh, my daily income. Here, down with this hot scotch and cheer up your soul. Here's with you, or no. You're hungry. Sit down. Not a bite for me. I'm past it. I can't eat these days. But I'll drink with you till I drop. Come. Barrel for barrel, I'm with you, ready. Here we go. Now then, Lloyd, unreal your story while I brew. Unreal it? What, again? Again. Again? What do you mean by that? Why, I mean, do you want to hear it over again? Do I want to hear it over again? This is a puzzler. Wait, don't take any more of that liquid. You don't need it. Look here, Henry, you alarm me. Didn't I tell you the whole story on the way here? You? Yes, I. I'll be hanged if I heard a word of it. Henry, this is a serious thing. It troubles me. What did you take up yonder at the minister's? Then it all flashed on me, and I owned up like a man. I took the dearest girl in this world, prisoner. So then he came with a rush, and we shook and shook and shook till our hands ached. And he didn't blame me for not having heard a word of a story which had lasted while we walked three miles. He just sat down then like the patient good fellow he was and told it all over again. Synopsized, it amounted to this. He had come to England with what he thought was a grand opportunity. He had an option to sell the Gould and Curry extension for the locators of it and keep all he could get over a million dollars. He had worked hard and pulled every wire he knew of, had left no honest expedient untried, had spent nearly all the money he had in the world, 
had not been able to get a solitary capitalist to listen to him, and his option would run out at the end of the month. In a word, he was ruined. Then he jumped up and cried out, Henry, you can save me, you can save me, and you're the only man in the universe that can. Will you do it? Won't you do it? Tell me how. Speak out, my boy. Give me a million and my passage home for my option. Don't, don't refuse. I was in kind of an agony. I was right on the point of coming out with the words, Lloyd, I'm a pauper myself, absolutely penniless and in debt. But a white-hot idea came flaming through my head, and I gripped my jaws together and calmed myself down till I was as cold as a capitalist. Then I said in a commercial and self-possessed way, I will save you, Lloyd. Then I'm already saved. God be merciful to you forever. If ever I... Let me finish, Lloyd. I will save you, but not in that way, for that would not be fair to you after all your hard work and the risks you've run. I don't need to buy mines. I can keep my capital moving in a commercial center like London without that. It's what I'm at all the time. But here is what I'll do. I know all about that mine, of course. I know its immense value and can swear to it if anybody wishes it. You shall sell out inside of the fortnight for three millions cash using my name freely and will divide share and share alike. Do you know, he would have danced a furniture to kindling wood in his insane joy, and broken everything in the place if I hadn't tripped him up and tied him. Then he lay there perfectly happy, saying, I may use your name. Your name! Think of it. Man, they'll flock in droves, these rich Londoners. They'll fight for that stock. I'm a made man. I'm a made man forever, and I'll never forget you as long as I live. In less than 24 hours, London was a buzz. I hadn't anything to do day after day but sit at home and say to all comers, Yes, I told him to refer to me. I know the man, and I know the mine. His character is above reproach, and the mine is worth far more than he asks for it. Meantime, I spent all my evenings at the minister's with Portia. I didn't say a word to her about the mine. I saved it for a surprise. We talked salary. Never anything but salary and love. Sometimes love, sometimes salary. Sometimes love and salary together. And my, the interest the minister's wife and daughter took in our little affair and the endless ingenuities they invented to save us from interruption and to keep the minister in the dark and unsuspicious. Well, it was just lovely of them. When the month was up at last, I had a million dollars to my credit in the London and County Bank, and Hastings was fixed in the same way. Dressed at my level best, I drove by the house in Portland Place, judged by the look of things that my birds were home again, went on towards the ministers and got my precious, and we started back, talking salary with all our might. She was so excited and anxious that it made her just intolerably beautiful. I said, Dearie, the way you're looking, it's a crime to strike for salary a single penny under three thousand a year. Henry, Henry, you'll ruin us. Don't be afraid. Just keep up those looks and trust to me. It'll all come out right. So, as it turned out, I had to keep bolstering up her courage all the way. She kept pleading with me, saying, Oh, please remember that if we ask for too much, we may get no salary at all. And then what will become of us with no way in the world to earn our living? We were ushered in by that same servant, and there they were, the two old gentlemen. Of course, they were surprised to see that wonderful creature with me, but I said, it's All right, gentlemen, she is my future stay and helpmate. And I introduced them to her and called them by name. It didn't surprise them. They knew I would know enough to consult the directory. They seated us and were very polite to me and very solicitous to relieve her from embarrassment and put her as much at ease as they could. Then I said, Gentlemen, I am ready to report. We are glad to hear it, said my man. 
for now we can decide the bet which my brother Abel and I made. If you have won for me, you shall have any situation in my gift. Have you the million-pound note? Here it is, sir. And I handed it to him. I've won, he shouted, and slapped Abel on the back. Now what do you say, brother? I say he did survive, and I've lost twenty thousand pounds. I would never have believed it. I have a further report to make, I said, and a pretty long one. I want you to let me come soon and detail my whole month's history. And I promise and I promise you it's worth hearing. Meantime, take a look at that. What, man? Certificate of deposit for two hundred thousand pounds? Is it yours? Mine. I earned it by thirty days' judicious use of that little loan you let me have, and the only use I made of it was to buy trifles and offer the bill in change. Come, this is astonishing. It's incredible, man. Never mind, I'll prove it. Don't take my word unsupported. But now Portia's turn was come to be surprised. Her eyes were spread wide, and she said, Henry, is that really your money? Have you been fibbing to me? I have indeed, dearie. But you'll forgive me, I know. She put up an arch pout and said, Don't you be so sure. You are a naughty thing to deceive me, sir. Oh, you'll get over it, sweetheart. You'll get over it. It was only fun, you know. Come, let's be going. But wait. Wait, the situation, you know. I want to give you the situation, said my man. Well, I said, I'm just as grateful as I can be, but I really don't want one. But you can have the choicest one in my gift. Thanks again with all my heart, but I don't even want that one. Henry, I'm ashamed of you. You don't half thank the good gentleman. May I do it for you? Indeed you shall, dear, if you can improve it. Let us see you try. She walked to my man got up in his lap, put her arm around his neck, and kissed him right on the mouth. Then the two old gentlemen shouted with laughter. But I was dumbfounded, just petrified, as you may say. Portia said, Papa, he has said you haven't a situation in your gift that he'd take, and I feel just as hurt as... My darling, is that your papa? Yes, he's my step-papa, and the dearest one that ever was. You understand now, don't you, why I was able to laugh when you told me at the minister's, not knowing my relationships, what trouble and worry papa's and Uncle Abel's scheme was giving you. Of course, I spoke right up now, without any fooling, and went straight to the point. Oh, my dearest dear sir, I want to take back what I said. You have got a situation open that I want. Name it. Son-in-law. Well, well, well. But, you know, if you haven't ever served in that capacity, you, of course, can't furnish recommendations of a sort to satisfy the conditions of the contract, and so... Try me! Oh, do, I beg you. Only just try me for thirty or forty years, and if... Oh, well, all right. It's but a little thing to ask. Take her along. Happy we two? <laughs> there are not words enough in the unabridged to describe it. And when London got the whole history, a day or two later, of my month's adventures with that banknote, and how they ended, did London talk and have a good time? Yes. My Portia's papa took that friendly and hospitable bill back to the Bank of England and cashed it, and then the bank cancelled it and made him a present of it. And he gave it to us at our wedding. And it was a and it has always hung in its frame in the sacredest place in our home ever since. For it gave me my Portia. But for it, I could not have remained in London, would not have appeared at the minister's, should never have met her. And so, I always say, yes, it's a million pounder, as you see, but it never made but one purchase in its life, and then got the article for only about a tenth of its value. End of the Million Pound Banknote by Mark Twain Recording by Peter David Smith www.artmovingon.blogspot.com
The Pensioner by William Kane. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Pensioner by William Kane. Miss Crewe was born in the year 1821. She received a sort of education, and at the age of twenty became the governess of a little girl, eight years old, called Martha Bond. She was Martha's governess for the next ten years. Then Martha came out, and Miss Crewe went to be the governess of somebody else. Martha married Mr. William Harper. A year later she gave birth to a son, who was named Edward. This brings us to the year 1853. When Edward was six, Miss Crewe came back to be his governess. Four years later he went to school, and Miss Crewe went away to be the governess of somebody else. She was now forty-two years old. Twelve years passed, and Mrs. Harper died, recommending Miss Crewe to her husband's care, for Miss Crewe had recently been smitten by an incurable disease which made it impossible for her to be a governess any longer. Mr. Harper, who had passionately loved his wife, gave instructions to a solicitor to pay Miss Crewe the sum of one hundred and fifty pounds annually. He had some thoughts of buying her an annuity, but she seemed so ill that he didn't. Edward was now twenty-two. In the year 1888, Mr. Harper died after a very short illness. He had expected Miss Crewe to die any day during the past thirteen years, but since she hadn't, he thought it proper now to recommend her to Edward's care. This is how he did it. "'That confounded old crew, Eddie. You'll have to see to her. Let her have her money as before, but for the Lord's sake don't go and buy her an annuity now. If you do, she'll die on your hands in a week.' Shortly afterwards, the old gentleman passed away. Edward was now thirty-five. Miss Crewe was sixty-seven, and reported to be in an almost desperate state. Edward followed his father's advice. He bought no annuity for Miss Crewe. Her one hundred and fifty pounds continued to be paid each year into her bank, but by Edward, not by his late father's solicitors. Edward had his own ideas of managing the considerable fortune which he had inherited. These ideas were unsound. The first of them was that he should assume the entire direction of his own affairs. Accordingly, he instructed his solicitors to realize all the mortgages and railway stock and other admirable securities in which his money was invested, and hand over the cash to him. He then went in for the highest rate of interest which anyone would promise him. The consequence was that, within twelve years, he was almost a poor man, his annual income having dwindled from about three thousand to about four hundred pounds. Though he was a fool, he was an honourable man, and so he continued to pay Miss Crewe her one hundred and fifty pounds each year. This left him about two hundred and fifty for himself. The capital which his so reduced income represented was invested in a Mexican brewery in which he had implicit faith. Nevertheless, he began to think that he might do well were he to try to earn a little extra money. The only thing he could do was to paint, not at all well, in watercolours. He became the pupil, quite seriously, of a young artist whom he knew. He was now forty-seven years old, while Miss Crewe was seventy-nine. The year was nineteen hundred. To everybody's amazement, Edward soon began to make quite good progress in his painting. Yes, his pictures were not at all unpleasant little things. He sent one of them to the academy. It was accepted. It was, as I live, sold for ten pounds. Edward was an artist. Soon he was making between thirty and forty pounds a year. Then he was making over a hundred, then two hundred. Then the Mexican brewery failed, General Malafico having burned it to the ground for a lark. This happened in the spring of 1914, when Edward was sixty-one and Miss Crewe was ninety-three. Edward, after paying her money to Miss Crewe, might flatter himself on the possibility of having some fifty pounds a year for himself, that is to say, if his picture sales did not decline. A single man can, however, get along, more or less, on fifty pounds, more or less. Then the Great War broke out. It has been said that in the autumn of 1914 the old man came into their kingdom. As the fields of Britain were gradually stripped bare of their valid toilers, the fathers of each village assumed, at good wages, the burden of agriculture. From their offices the juniors departed or were torn. The senior clerks carried on desperately until the girls were introduced. 
No man was any longer too old at forty. Octogenarians could command a salary. The very cinemas were glad to dress up ancient fellows in uniform and post them on their doorsteps. Edward could do nothing but paint rather agreeable watercolours, and that was all. The market for his kind of work was shut. A patriotic nation was economising in order to get five per cent on the war loans. People were not giving inexpensive little watercolours away to one another as wedding gifts any longer. Only the painters of high reputation, whose work was regarded as a real investment, could dispose of their wares. Starvation stared Edward in the face. Not only his own starvation, you understand, but Miss Crewe's. And Edward was a man of honour. He hated Miss Crewe intensely, but he had undertaken to provide for her, and provide for her he must, even if he failed to provide for himself. He wrapped some samples of his paintings in brown paper, and began to seek for a job among the wholesale stationers. He offered himself as one who was prepared to design Christmas cards and calendars and things of the kind. Adversity had sharpened his wits. Even the wholesale stationers were not turning white-headed men from their portals. To Edward was accorded the privilege of displaying the rather agreeable contents of his parcel. After he had unpacked it, and packed it up again some thirty times, he was off at work. His pictures were really rather agreeable. It was piecework, and he was to do it off the premises, no matter where. By toiling day and night he might be able to earn as much as four pounds a week. He went away and toiled. His employers were pleased with what, each Monday, he brought them. They did not offer to increase his remuneration, but they encouraged him to produce, and took practically everything he offered. Edward was very fortunate. During the first year of the war he lived like a beast worked like a slave, and earned exactly enough to keep his soul in his body and pay Miss Crewe her one hundred and fifty pounds. During the second year of the war he did it again. The fourth year of the war found him still alive and still punctual to his obligations towards Miss Crewe. Miss Crewe, however, found one hundred and fifty pounds no longer what it had been. Prices were rising in every direction. She wrote to Edward, pointing this out, and asking him if he couldn't see his way to increasing her allowance. She invoked the memory of his dear mother and father, added something about the happy hours that he and she had spent together in the dear old schoolroom, and signed herself his affectionately. Edward petitioned for an increase of pay. He pointed out to his firm of wholesale stationers that prices were rising in every direction. The firm, who knew when they had a marketable thing cheap, granted his petition. Henceforth, Edward was able to earn five pounds a week. He increased Miss Crewe's allowance by fifty pounds, and continued to live more like a beast than ever, for the price of paper and paints was soaring. He worked practically without ceasing, save to sleep, which he could not do, and to eat, which he could not afford. He was now sixty-four, while Miss Crewe was rising ninety-seven. Edward had been ailing for a long time. On Armistice Day, he struck work for an hour in order to walk about in the streets and share in the general rejoicing. He caught a severe cold, and the next day, instead of staying between his blankets—he had no sheets—he went up to the city with some designs which he had just completed. That night he was feverish. The next night he was delirious. The third night he was dead, and there was an end of him. He had, however, managed before he died—two days before— to send to Miss Crewe a money order for her quarter's allowance of fifty pounds. This had left him with precisely four shillings and tuppence in the post office savings bank. He was, consequently, buried by the parish. Miss Crewe received her money. She was delighted to have it, and at once wrote to Edward her customary letter of grateful and affectionate thanks. She added in a postscript that if he could find it in his generous heart— to let her have a still little more next quarter, it would be most acceptable, because every day seemed to make it harder and harder for her to get along. Edward was dead when this letter was delivered. Miss Crewe sent her money order to her bank, asking that it might be placed to her deposit account. This, she reminded the bank, would bring up the amount of her deposit to exactly two thousand pounds. End of the Pensioner by William Cain The Sisters by James Joyce This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Michael Fishbein. The Sisters by James Joyce. There was no hope for him this time. It was the third stroke. Night after night I had passed the house, it was vacation time, and studied the lighted square of window, and night after night I had found it lighted in the same way, faintly and evenly. If he was dead, I thought, I would see the reflection of candles in the dark and the blind, for I knew that two candles must be set at the head of a corpse. He had often said to me, I am not long for this world and I had thought his words idle. Now I knew they were true. Every night, as I gazed up at the window, I said softly to myself the word, Paralysis. It had always sounded strangely in my ears, like the word Norman in the Euclid, and the word Simony in the Catechism. But now it sounded to me like the name of some maleficent and sinful being, it filled me with fear, and yet I longed to be nearer to it, and to look upon its deadly work. Old Cotter was sitting at the fire, smoking, when I came downstairs to supper. While my aunt was ladling out my stirabout, he said, as if returning to some former remark of his, No, I wouldn't say he was exactly, but there was something queer, there was something uncanny about him. I'll tell you my opinion. He began to puff at his pipe, no doubt arranging his opinion in his mind. Tiresome old fool! When we knew him first, he used to be rather interesting, talking of faints and worms. But I soon grew tired of him and his endless stories about the distillery. "'I have my own theory about it,' he said. "'I think it was one of those peculiar cases, but it's hard to say.' He began to puff at his pipe without giving us his theory. My uncle saw me staring, and said to me, "'Well, so your old friend is gone, you'll be sorry to hear.' "'Who?' said I. "'Father Flynn. Is he dead?' "'Mr. Cotter here has just told us. He was passing by the house.' I knew that I was under observation, so I continued eating as if the news had not interested me. My uncle explained to old Cotter, the youngster and he were great friends. The old chap taught him a great deal, mind you. And they say he had a great wish for him. God have mercy on his soul, said my aunt piously. Old Cotter looked at me for a while. I felt that his little beady black eyes were examining me. But I would not satisfy him by looking up from my plate. He returned to his pipe and finally spat rudely into the grate. I wouldn't like children of mine, he said, to have too much to say to a man like that. How do you mean, Mr. Cotter? asked my aunt. What I mean is, said old Cotter, it's bad for children. My idea is, let a young lad run about and play with young lads of his own age, and not be... Am I right, Jack? Aye, that's my principle, too, said my uncle. Let him learn to box his corner. That's what I'm always saying to that Rosicrucian there, take exercise. Why, when I was a nipper, every morning of my life I had a cold bath, winter and summer. And that's what stands to me now. Education is all very fine and large. Uh, Mr. Cotter might take a pick of that leg mutton, he added to my aunt. No, no, not for me, said old Cotter. My aunt brought the dish from the safe and put it on the table. "'But why do you think it's not good for children, Mr. Cotter?' she asked. "'It's bad for children,' said old Cotter, "'because their minds are so impressionable. "'When children see things like that, you know, it has an effect.' "'I crammed my mouth with stirabout "'for fear I might give utterance to my anger. "'Tiresome old red-nosed imbecile!' "'It was late when I fell asleep.' Though I was angry with old Cotter for alluding to me as a child, I puzzled my head to extract meaning from his unfinished sentences. In the dark of my room I imagined that I saw again the heavy gray face of the paralytic. 
I drew the blankets over my head and tried to think of Christmas, but the gray face still followed me. It murmured, and I understood that it desired to confess something. I felt my soul receding into some pleasant and vicious region. And there again I found it waiting for me. It began to confess to me in a murmuring voice. And I wondered why it smiled continually, and why the lips were so moist with spittle. But then I remembered that it had died of paralysis. And I felt that I, too, was smiling feebly, as if to absolve the simoniac of his sin. The next morning after breakfast I went down to look at the little house in Great Britain Street. It was an unassuming shop, registered under the vague name of Drapery. The drapery consisted mainly of children's booties and umbrellas, and on ordinary days a notice used to hang in the window, saying, Umbrellas Recovered. No notice was visible now, for the shutters were up. A crepe bouquet was tied to the door-knocker with ribbon. Two poor women and a telegram boy were reading the card pinned on the crepe. I also approached and read, July 1st, 1895. The Rev. James Flynn, formerly of St. Catherine's Church, Meath Street, aged sixty-five years, R.I.P. The reading of the card persuaded me that he was dead, and I was disturbed to find myself at check. Had he not been dead, I would have gone into the little dark room behind the shop to find him sitting in his armchair by the fire, nearly smothered in his greatcoat. Perhaps my aunt would have given me a packet of high toast for him, and this present would have roused him from his stupefied doze. It was always I who emptied the packet into his black snuff-box, for his hands trembled too much to allow him to do this without spilling half the snuff about the floor. Even as he raised his large trembling hand to his nose, little clouds of smoke dribbled through his fingers over the front of his coat. It may have been these constant showers of snuff which gave his ancient priestly garments their green, faded look, for the red handkerchief, blackened as it always was with the snuff stains of a week, with which he tried to brush away the fallen grains, was quite inefficacious. I wished to go in and look at him, but I had not the courage to knock. I walked away, slowly, along the sunny side of the street, reading all the theatrical advertisements in the shop windows as I went. I found it strange that neither I nor the day seemed in a morning mood, and I felt even annoyed at discovering in myself a sensation of freedom, as if I had been freed from something by his death. I wondered at this, for, as my uncle had said the night before, he had taught me a great deal. He had studied in the Irish college in Rome, and he had taught me to pronounce Latin properly. He had told me stories about the catacombs and about Napoleon Bonaparte, and he had explained to me the meaning of the different ceremonies of the Mass, and of the different vestments worn by the priest. Sometimes he had amused himself by putting difficult questions to me, asking me what one should do in certain circumstances, or whether such and such sins were mortal, or venial, or only imperfections. His questions showed me how complex and mysterious were certain institutions of the Church which I had always regarded as the simplest acts. The duties of the priest toward the Eucharist and toward the secrecy of the confessional seemed so grave to me that I wondered how anybody had ever found in himself the courage to undertake them. And I was not surprised when he told me that the fathers of the Church had written books as thick as the post-office directory and as closely printed as the law notices in the newspaper, elucidating all these intricate questions. Often, when I thought of this, I could make no answer, or only a very foolish and halting one, upon which he used to smile and nod his head twice or thrice. Sometimes he used to put me through the responses of the Mass, which he had made me learn by heart, and as I pattered he used to smile pensively and nod his head now and then pushing huge pinches of snuff up each nostril alternately. When he smiled, he used to uncover his big discolored teeth and let his tongue lie upon his lower lip, a habit which had made me feel uneasy in the beginning of our acquaintance before I knew him well. 
As I walked along in the sun, I remembered old Cotter's words, and tried to remember what had happened afterwards in the dream. I remembered that I had noticed long velvet curtains, and a swinging lamp of antique fashion. I felt that I had been very far away in some land where the customs were strange. In Persia, I thought. But I could not remember the end of the dream. In the evening my aunt took me with her to visit the house of mourning. It was after sunset. But the window panes of the house that looked to the west reflected the tawny gold of a great bank of clouds. Nanny received us in the hall, and, as it would have been unseemly to have shouted at her, my aunt shook hands with her for all. The old woman pointed upwards interrogatively, and, on my aunt's nodding, proceeded to toil up the narrow staircase before us, her bowed head being scarcely above the level of the banister rail. At the first landing she stopped and beckoned us forward encouragingly toward the open door of the dead room. My aunt went in, and the old woman, seeing that I hesitated to enter, began to beckon to me again repeatedly with her hand. I went in on tiptoe. The room through the lace end of the blind was suffused with dusky golden light, amid which the candles looked like pale thin flames. He had been coffined. Nanny gave the lead, and we three knelt down at the foot of the bed. I pretended to pray, but I could not gather my thoughts, because the old woman's mutterings distracted me. I noticed how clumsily her skirt was hooked at the back, and how the heels of her cloth boots were trodden down all to one side. The fancy came to me that the old priest was smiling as he lay there in his coffin. But no. When we rose and went to the head of the bed, I saw that he was not smiling. There he lay, solemn and copious, vested as for the altar, his large hands loosely retaining a chalice. His face was very truculent, gray and massive, with black cavernous nostrils, encircled by a scanty white fur. There was a heavy odor in the room, the flowers. We crossed ourselves and came away. In the little room downstairs we found Eliza seated in his armchair in state. I groped my way towards my usual chair in the corner, while Nanny went to the sideboard and brought out a decanter of sherry and some wine glasses. She set these on the table and invited us to take a little glass of wine. Then, at her sister's bidding, she filled out the sherry into the glasses and passed them to us. She pressed me to take some cream crackers also, but I declined because I thought I would make too much noise eating them. She seemed to be somewhat disappointed in my refusal, and went over quietly to the sofa where she sat down behind her sister. No one spoke. We all gazed at the empty fireplace. My aunt waited until Eliza sighed and then said, Ah, well, he's gone to a better world. Eliza sighed again, and bowed her head in assent. My aunt fingered the stem of her wine-glass before sipping a little. "'Did he peacefully?' she asked. "'Oh, quite peacefully, ma'am,' said Eliza. "'You couldn't tell when the breath went out of him. He had a beautiful death, God be praised. "'And everything?' "'Father O'Rourke was in with him a Tuesday, and anointed him and prepared him and all. "'He knew, then.' He was quite resigned. He looks quite resigned, said my aunt. That's what the woman we had in to wash him said. She said he just looked as if he was asleep. He looked that peaceful and resigned. No one would think he'd make such a beautiful corpse. Yes, indeed, said my aunt. She sipped a little more from her glass, and said, Well, Miss Flynn, at any rate, it must be a great comfort for you to know that you did all you could for him. You were both very kind to him, I must say. Eliza smoothed her dress over her knees. Ah, poor James, she said. God knows we done all we could, as poor as we are. We wouldn't see him want anything while he was in it. Nanny had leaned her head against the sofa pillow and seemed about to fall asleep. "'There's poor Nanny,' said Eliza, looking at her. "'She's wore out. "'All the work we had, she and me, 
getting in the woman to wash him and then laying him out, and then the coffin and then arranging about the mass in the chapel. Only for Father O'Rourke I don't know what we'd done at all. It was him brought us all them flowers and them two candlesticks out of the chapel, and wrote out the notice for the Freeman's General, and took charge of all the papers for the cemetery and poor James's insurance. "'Wasn't that good of him?' said my aunt. Eliza closed her eyes and shook her head slowly. "'Ah, there's no friends like the old friends,' she said, "'when all is said and done, no friends that a body can trust.' "'Indeed, that's true,' said my aunt. "'And I'm sure now that he's gone to his eternal reward, "'he won't forget you and all your kindness to him.' "'Ah, poor James,' said Eliza. "'He was no great trouble to us. "'You wouldn't hear him in the house any more than now. "'Still, I know he's gone and all to that. "'It's when it's all over that you'll miss him.' said my aunt. I know that, said Eliza. I won't be bringing him in his cup of beef tea any me, nor you, ma'am, sending him his snuff. Ah, oh, poor James. She stopped, as if she were communing with the past, and then said shrewdly, Mind you, I noticed there was something queer coming over him latterly. Whenever I'd bring in his soup to him, there I'd find him, with his breviary fallen to the floor lying back in the chair and his mouth open. She laid a finger against her nose and frowned. Then she continued. But still and all, he kept on saying that before the summer was over he'd go out for a drive one fine day just to see the old house again, where we were all born down in Irish town, and take me and Nanny with him. If we could only get one of them new-fangled carriages that makes no noise that Father O'Rourke told him about, them with the uh, romantic wheels, for the day cheap, he said at Johnny Rush's over the way there, and drive out the three of us together of a Sunday evening. He had his mind set on that. Poor James! The Lord have mercy on his soul, said my aunt. Eliza took out her handkerchief and wiped her eyes with it. Then she put it back again in her pocket and gazed into the empty grate for some time without speaking. He was too scrupulous, always, she said. The duties of the priesthood was too much for him, and then his life was, you might say, crossed. Yes, said my aunt, he was a disappointed man, you could see that. A silence took possession of the little room, and under cover of it I approached the table and tasted my sherry, and then returned quietly to my chair in the corner. Eliza seemed to have fallen into a deep reverie. We waited respectfully for her to break the silence, and after a long pause she said slowly, It was that chalice he broke. That was the beginning of it. Of course they say it was all right that it contained nothing, I mean, but still they say it was the boy's fault. But poor James was so nervous, God be merciful to him. "'And was that it?' said my aunt. "'I heard something.' Eliza nodded. "'That affected his mind,' she said. "'After that he began to mope by himself, "'talking to no one and wandering about by himself. "'So one night he was wanted for to go on a call, "'and they couldn't find him anywhere. "'They looked high up and low down, "'and still they couldn't see a sight of him anywhere. "'So then the clerk suggested to try the chapel. "'So then they got the keys and opened the chapel.' and the clock and Father O'Rourke and another priest that was there brought in a light for to look for him. And what do you think? But there he was, sitting up by himself in the dark, in his confession box, wide awake and laughing like, softly to himself. She stopped suddenly as if to listen. I, too, listened. But there was no sound in the house, and I knew that the old priest was lying still in his coffin, as we had seen him, solemn. And truculent in death, an idle chalice on his breast. Eliza resumed, wide awake and laughing like to himself. So then, of course, when they saw that, that made them think that there was something gone wrong with him. End of The Sisters by James Joyce Recording by Michael Fishbein, Minneapolis.
the storm by kate chopin this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information and to learn how to volunteer please visit librivox.org one the leaves were so still that even bb thought it was going to rain bobineau who was accustomed to converse on terms of perfect equality with his little son called the child's attention to certain sombre clouds that were rolling with sinister intention from the west accompanied by a sullen threatening roar they were at friedheimer's store and decided to remain there till the storm had passed they sat within the door on two empty kegs bb was four years old and looked very wise mamma'll be fred yes he suggested with blinking eyes she'll shut the house maybe she got sylvie helping her this evening bobino responded reassuringly no she ain't got sylvie sylvie was helping her yesterday piped bb bobino arose and going across to the counter purchased a can of shrimps of which calixto was very fond then he returned to his perch on the keg and sat solidly holding the can of shrimps while the storm burst it shook the wooden store and seemed to be ripping great furrows in the distant field b b laid his little hand on his father's knee and was not afraid two calixta at home felt no uneasiness for their safety she sat at a side window sewing furiously on a sewing machine she was greatly occupied and did not notice the approaching storm but she felt very warm and often stopped to mop her face on which the perspiration gathered in beads she unfastened her white sack at the throat it began to grow dark and suddenly realizing the situation she got up hurriedly and went about closing windows and doors out on the small front gallery she had hung bobineau's sunday clothes to air and she hastened out to gather them before the rain fell as she stepped outside alcee laballiere rode in at the gate she had not seen him very often since her marriage and never alone she stood there with bobineau's coat in her hands and the big raindrops began to fall alcee rode his horse under the shelter of a side projection where the chickens had huddled, and there where ploughs and harrow piled up in the corner. "'May I come and wait in your gallery till the storm is over, Galixta? he asked. "'Come long in, Monsieur Alcée.' His voice and her own startled her as if from a trance, and she seized Bobineau's vest. Alcée, mounting to the porch, grabbed the trousers, and snatched Bibi's braided jacket that was about to be carried away by a sudden gust of wind. He expressed an intention to remain outside, but it was soon apparent that he might as well have been out in the open. The water beat in upon the boards and driving sheets, and he went inside, closing the door after him. It was even necessary to put something beneath the door to keep the water out. My, what a rain! It's good two years since it rained like that, exclaimed Calixta, as she rolled up a piece of bagging, and Alcée helped her to thrust it beneath the crack. She was a little fuller of figure than five years before when she married, but she had lost nothing of her vivacity. Her blue eyes still retained their melting quality, and her yellow hair, disheveled by the wind and rain, kinked more stubbornly than ever about her ears and temples. The rain beat upon the low shingled roof with a force and clatter that threatened to break an entrance and deluge them there. They were in the dining room, the sitting room, the general utility room. Adjoining was her bedroom, with the BB's couch alongside her own. The door stood open, and the room with its white monumental bed, its closed shutters, looked dim and mysterious. Alcée flung himself into a rocker, and Calixta nervously began to gather up from the floor the lengths of a cotton sheet which she had been sewing. If this keeps up, dear say, if the levy is going to stand it, 
she exclaimed. What have you to do with the levies? I've got enough to do, and there's Bobino with B.B. out in the storm, if he only didn't let Friedheimers. Let us hope, Calix, that that Bobino's got sense enough to come in out of a cyclone. She went and stood at the window with a greatly disturbed look on her face. She wiped the frame that was clouded with moisture. It was stiflingly hot. Alce got up and joined her at the window, looking over her shoulder. The rain was coming down in sheets, obscuring the view of far-off cabins, and enveloping the distant wood in a gray mist. The playing of the lightning was incessant. A bolt struck a tall chinaberry tree at the edge of the field. It filled all visible space with a blinding glare, and the crash seemed to invade the very boards they stood upon. Calixta put her hands to her eyes, and with a cry staggered backwards. Alcée's arm encircled her, and for an instant he drew her close and spasmodically to him. Monte! she cried, releasing herself from his encircling arm, and retreating from the window. The house'll go next, if I only knew where B.B. was. She would not compose herself. She would not be seated. Alcée clasped her shoulders and looked into her face. The contact of her warm, palpitating body, when he had unthinkingly drawn her into his arms, had aroused all the old-time infatuation and desire for her flesh. Calista, he said, don't be frightened. Nothing can happen. The house is too low to be struck, with so many tall trees standing about. There. Aren't you going to be quiet? Say, aren't you? He pushed her hair back from her face that was warm and steaming. Her lips were as red and moist as pomegranate seed. Her white neck and a glimpse of her full, firm bosom disturbed him powerfully. As she glanced up at him, the fear in her liquid blue eyes had given place to a drowsy gleam that unconsciously betrayed a sensuous desire. He looked down into her eyes, and there was nothing for him to do but to gather her lips in a kiss. It reminded him of Assumption. Do you remember? In Assumption, Calixta? He asked in a low voice, broken by passion. Oh, she remembered, for in Assumption he had kissed her and kissed and kissed her, until his senses would well nigh fall, and to save her he would resort to a desperate flight. If she was not an immaculate dove in those days, she was still inviolate, a passionate creature whose very defenselessness had made her defense, against which his honor forbade him to prevail. Now, well, now her lips seemed in a manner free to be tasted, as well as her round white throat and her whiter breasts. They did not heed the crashing torrents, and the roar of the elements made her laugh as she lay in his arms. She was a revelation in the dim, mysterious chamber, as white as the couch she lay upon, her firm, elastic flesh that was knowing for the first time its birthright, like a creamy lily that the sun invites to contribute its breath and perfume to the undying life of the world. The generous abundance of her passion, without guile or trickery, was like a white flame which penetrated and found repose in depths of her own sensuous nature that had never yet been reached. When he touched her breasts, they gave themselves up in quivering ecstasy, inviting his lips. Her mouth was a fountain of delight, and when he possessed her, they seemed to swoon together at the very borderland of life's mystery. He stayed cushioned upon her, breathless, dazed, enervated, with his heart beating like a hammer upon her. With one hand she clasped his head, her lips lightly touching his forehead. The other hand stroked with a soothing rhythm his muscular shoulders. The growl of the thunder was distant and passing away. The rain beat softly upon the shingles, inviting them to drowsiness and sleep but they dare not yield. The rain was over. 
the sun was turning the glistening green world into a palace of gems calixta on the gallery watched alce right away he turned and smiled at her with a beaming face and she lifted her pretty chin in the air and laughed aloud three bobino and bb trudging home stopped without at the cistern to make themselves presentable my bb what will you mamma say you ought to be ashamed you oughtn't put on those good pants look at them and what mud on your collar how you got that mud on your collar bb <laughs> i never saw such a boy bb was the picture of pathetic resignation bobino was the embodiment of serious solicitude as he strove to remove from his own person and his son's the signs of their tramp over heavy roads and through wet fields he scraped the mud off bb's bare legs and feet with a stick and carefully removed all traces from his heavy brogans then prepared for the worst the meeting with an overscrupulous wife they entered cautiously at the back door calixta was preparing supper she had set the table and was dripping coffee at the hearth she sprang up as they came in oh bobby no you back my i was uneasy where you been during the rain and bibi he ain't wet he ain't hurt she had clasped bibi and was kissing him effusively bobby knows explanations and apologies which he had been composing all along the way died on his lips as calixta felt him to see if he were dry and seemed to express nothing but satisfaction at their safe return i brought you some shrimps calixta offered bobino hauling the can from his ample side pocket and laying it on the table shrimps oh bobino you to go for anything and she gave him a smacking kiss on the cheek that resounded je vous réponds we have a feast tonight oh <laughs> bobino and bb began to relax and enjoy themselves and when the three seated themselves at table they laughed much and so loud that any one might have heard them as far away as la Balliere's. four alcee la Balliere wrote to his wife clarice that night it was a loving letter full of tender solicitude he told her not to hurry back but if she and the babies liked it at biloxi to stay a month longer he was getting on nicely and though he missed them he was willing to bear the separation a while longer realizing that their health and pleasure were the first things to be considered five as for clarice she was charmed upon receiving her husband's letter she and the babies were doing well the society was agreeable many of her old friends and acquaintances were at the bay and the first free breath since her marriage seemed to restore the pleasant liberty of her maiden days devoted as she was to her husband their intimate conjugal life was something which she was more than willing to forego for a while so the storm passed and every one was happy End of The Storm by Kate Chopin. This recording is in the public domain. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake. The Tale of Mr. Jeremy Fisher by Beatrix Potter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Dunlap. The Tale of Mr. Jeremy Fisher by Beatrix Potter. Once upon a time, there was a frog called Mr. Jeremy Fisher. He lived in a little damp house amongst the buttercups at the edge of a pond. The water was all slippy sloppy in the larder and in the back passage. But Mr. Jeremy liked getting his feet wet, nobody ever scolded him and he never caught a cold he was quite pleased when he looked out and saw large drops of rain splashing in the pond 
I will get some worms and go fishing and catch a dish of minnows for my dinner, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. If I catch more than five fish, I will invite my friends, Mr. Alderman Ptolemy Tortoise and Sir Isaac Newton. The alderman, however, eats salad. Mr. Jeremy put on a Macintosh and a pair of shiny galoshes. He took his rod and basket and set off with enormous hops to the place where he kept his boat. The boat was round and green and very like the other lily leaves. It was tied to a water plant in the middle of the pond. Mr. Jeremy took a reed pole and pushed the boat out into open water. I know a good place for minnows, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. Mr. Jeremy stuck his pole into the mud and fastened the boat to it. Then he settled himself cross-legged and arranged his fishing tackle. He had the dearest little red float. His rod was a tough stalk of grass. His line was a fine long white horse hair, and he tied a little wriggling worm at the end. The rain trickled down his back, and for nearly an hour he stared at the float. This is getting tiresome. I think I should like some lunch, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. He punted back again amongst the water plants and took some lunch out of his basket. I will eat a butterfly sandwich and wait till the shower is over, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. A great big water beetle came up underneath the lily leaf and tweaked the toe of one of his galoshes. Mr. Jeremy crossed his legs up shorter, out of reach, and went on eating his sandwich. Once or twice something moved about with a rustle and a splash amongst the rushes at the side of the pond. I trust that is not a rat, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. I think I had better get away from here. Mr. Jeremy shoved the boat out again a little way and dropped in the bait. There was a bite almost directly. The float gave a tremendous bobbit. A minnow! A minnow! I have him by the nose, cried Mr. Jeremy Fisher, jerking up his rod. But what a horrible surprise. Instead of a smooth, fat minnow, Mr. Jeremy landed little Jack Sharp, the stickleback, covered with spines. The stickleback floundered about the boat, pricking and snapping until he was quite out of breath. Then he jumped back into the water. And a shoal of other little fishes put their heads out and laughed at Mr. Jeremy Fisher. And while Mr. Jeremy sat disconsolately on the edge of his boat, sucking his sore fingers and peering down into the water, a much worse thing happened. A really frightful thing it would have been if Mr. Jeremy had not been wearing a Macintosh. A great, big, enormous trout came up, kerflop a pup with a splash, and it seized Mr. Jeremy with a snap. Ow, ow, ow! And then it turned and dived down to the bottom of the pond. But the trout was so displeased with the taste of the Macintosh that in less than half a minute it spat him out again, and the only thing it swallowed was Mr. Jeremy's galoshes. Mr. Jeremy bounced up to the surface of the water like a cork and the bubbles of a soda water bottle and he swam with all his might to the edge of the pond. He scrambled out on the first bank he came to, and he hopped home across the meadow with his Macintosh all in tatters. What a mercy that was not a pike, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. I have lost my rod and basket, but it does not much matter, for I am sure I should never have dared to go fishing again. He put some sticking plaster on his fingers, and his friends both came to dinner. He could not offer them fish, but he had something else in his larder. Sir Isaac Newton wore his black and gold waistcoat, and Mr. Alderman Ptolemy Tortoise brought a salad with him in a string bag. And instead of a nice dish of minnows, they had a roasted grasshopper with ladybird sauce, which frogs consider a beautiful treat, but I think it must have been nasty. End of the tale of Mr. Jeremy Fisher The Woman Beater by Israel Zangwill. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alana Jordan. The Woman Beater by Israel Zangwill. Part 1 She came to meet John LaFalle. But John LaFalle did not know he was to meet Winifred Glamouris. He did not even know he himself was the meeting point of all the brilliant and beautiful persons, assembled in the publisher's Saturday salon, 
for although a youthful minor poet, he was modest and lovable. Perhaps his Oxford tutorship was sobering. At any rate, his head remained unturned by his precocious fame, and to meet these other young men and women, his reverend seniors on the slopes of Parnassus, gave him more pleasure than the receipt of royalties. Not that his publisher afforded him much opportunity of contrasting the two pleasures. The profits of the muse went to provide this room of old furniture and roses, this beautiful garden a twinkle with Japanese lanterns, like gorgeous fireflowers blossoming under the white crescent moon of early June. Winifred Glamouries was not literary herself. She was better than a poetess. She was a poem. The publisher always threw in a few realities, and some beautiful brainless creature would generally be found the nucleus of a crowd, while Cleo in spectacles languished in a corner. Winifred Glamouries, however, was reputed to have a tongue that matched her eye, paralleling with whimsies and epigrams, its freakish fires and witcheries, and, assuredly, flitting in her white gown through the dark, balmy garden, she seemed the very spirit of moonlight, the subtle incarnation of night and roses. When John Lafalle met her, Cecilia was with her, and the first conversation was triangular. Cecilia fired most of the shots. She was a bouncing, rattling beauty, chock full of confidence and high spirits, except when asked to do the one thing she could do, sing. Then she became, quite genuinely, a nervous, hesitant, pale little thing. However, the suppliant hostess bore her off, and presently her rich contralto notes passed through the garden, adding to its passion and mystery, and through the open French windows John could see her standing against the wall near the piano, her head thrown back, her eyes half closed, her creamy throat swelling in the very abandonment of artistic ecstasy. "'What a charming creature!' he exclaimed involuntarily. "'That's what everybody thinks except her husband,' Winifred laughed. "'Is he blind, then?' John asked, with his cloistral naivete. "'Blind? No. Love is blind. Marriage is never blind.' The bitterness in her tone pierced John. He felt vaguely the passing of some icy current from unknown seas of experience. Cecilia's voice soared out enchantingly. "'Then marriage must be deaf,' he said, "'or such music as that would charm it.' She smiled sadly. Her smile was the tricksy play of moonlight among clouds of fairy. "'You have never been married,' she said simply. "'Do you mean that you, too, are neglected?' Something impelled him to exclaim. "'Worse,' she murmured. "'It is incredible,' he cried. "'You?' "'Hush. My husband will hear you.' Her warning whisper brought him into a delicious conspiracy with her. "'Which is your husband?' he whispered back. There, near the casement, standing, gazing, open-mouthed at Cecilia. He always opens his mouth when she sings. It is like two toys moved by the same wire. He looked at the tall, stalwart, ruddy-haired Anglo-Saxon. Do you mean to say he... I mean to say nothing. But you said... I said worse. Why, what can be worse? She put her hand over her face. I am ashamed to tell you. How adorable was that half-divined blush! But you must tell me everything. He scarcely knew how he had leapt into this role of confessor. He only felt they were moved by the same wire. Her head dropped on her breast. He beats me. What? John forgot to whisper. It was the greatest shock his recluse life had known. Compact as it was of horror at the revelation, shamed confusion at her candor, 
and delicious pleasure in her confidence. This fragile, exquisite creature, under the rod of a brutal bully. Once he had gone to a wedding reception, and among the serious presents some grinning Philistine drew his attention to an uncouth club, a wife-beater, he called it. The flippancy had jarred upon John terribly. This intrusive reminder of the customs of the slums, it grated like Billingsgate in a boudoir. Now that savage weapon recurred to him. For a lurid instant he saw Winifred's husband wielding it. Oh, abomination of his sex! And did he stand there, in his immaculate evening dress, posing as an English gentleman? Even so might some gentleman burglar bear through a salon his imperturbable swallow-tail. Beat a woman! Beat that essence of charm and purity, God's best gift to man, redeeming him from his own grossness? Could such things be? John Lafalle would as soon have credited the French legend that English wives are sold in Smithfield. No, it could not be real that this flower-like figure was thrashed. Do you mean to say, he cried, the rapidity of her confidence alone made him feel it all of a dreamlike unreality. Hush! Cecilia singing, she admonished him with an unexpected smile, as her fingers fell from her face. Oh, you have been making fun of me. He was vastly relieved. He beats you at chess or at lawn tennis. Does one wear a high-necked dress to conceal the traces of chess or lawn tennis? He had not noticed her dress before, save for its spiritual whiteness, susceptible though he was to beautiful shoulders, Winifred's enchanting face had been sufficiently distracting. Now the thought of physical bruises gave him a second spasm of righteous horror. That delicate rose-leaf flesh abraded and lacerated. The ruffian! Does he use a stick or a fist? Both. But as a rule he just takes me by the arms and shakes me like a terrier or a rat. I'm all black and blue now. Poor butterfly, he murmured poetically. Why did I tell you? she murmured back with subtler poetry. The poet thrilled in every vein love at first sight, of which he had often read and often written, was then a reality. It could be as mutual, too, as Romeo's and Juliet's, but how awkward that Juliet should be married and her husband a Bill Sykes in broadcloth. Part Two Mrs. Glamorys herself gave at Holmes every Sunday afternoon, and so, on the morrow, after a sleepless night mitigated by perpended sonnets, the lovesick young tutor presented himself by invitation at the beautiful old house in Hampstead. He was enchanted to find his heart's mistress set in an eighteenth-century frame of small paned windows and of high oak paneling, and at once began to image her dancing minuets and playing on virginals. Her husband was absent, but a broad band of velvet round Winifred's neck was a painful reminder of his possibilities. Winifred, however, said it was only a touch of sore throat caught in the garden. Her eyes added that there was nothing in the pathological dictionary which she would not willingly have caught for the sake of those divine, if droughty moments but that, alas, it was more than a mere bodily ailment she had caught there. There were a great many visitors in the two delightfully quaint rooms, among whom he wandered disconsolate and admired, jealous of her scattered smiles, but presently he found himself seated by her side, on a cosy corner, near the open folding doors, with all the other guests huddled round a violinist in the inner room. How Winifred had managed it he did not know, 
but she sat plausibly in the outer room, awaiting newcomers, and this particular niche was invisible, save to a determined eye. He took her unresisting hand, that dear, warm hand, with its begemmed artistic fingers, and held it in uneasy beatitude. How wonderful! She, the beautiful and adored hostess, of whose sweetness and charm he heard even her own guests murmur to one another. It was her actual flesh-and-blood hand that lay in his, thrillingly tangible. Oh, adventure beyond all merit, beyond all hoping! But every now and then the outer door facing them would open on some newcomer, and John had hastily to release her soft, magnetic fingers and sit demure, and jealously overhear her effusive welcome to those innocent intruders, nor did his brow clear till she had shepherded them within the inner fold. Fortunately, the refreshments were in this section, so that once therein few of the sheep strayed back, and the jiggling wail of the violin was succeeded by a shrill babble of tongues and the clatter of cups and spoons. Get me an ice, please, strawberry, she ordered John during one of these forced intervals in manual flirtation, and when he had steered laboriously to and fro, he found a young actor beside her in his cosy corner, and his jealous fancy almost saw their hands dispart. He stood over them with a sickly smile while Winifred ate her ice. When he returned from depositing the empty saucer, the player fellow was gone, and in remorse for his mad suspicion he stooped and reverently lifted her fragrant fingertips to his lips. The door behind his back opened abruptly. Goodbye, she said, rising in a flash. The words had the calm, conventional cadence, and instantly extorted from him, amid all his dazedness, the corresponding goodbye. When he turned and saw it was Mr. Glamorys who had come in, his heart leapt wildly at the nearness of his escape. As he passed this masked ruffian, he nodded perfunctorily and received a cordial smile. Yes, he was handsome and fascinating enough, externally, this blond savage. A man may smile and smile and be a villain, John thought. I wonder how he'd feel if he knew I knew he beats women. Already John had generalized the charge. I hope Cecilia will keep him at arm's length, he had said to Winifred, if only that she may not smart for it some day. He lingered purposely in the hall to get an impression of the brute, who had begun talking loudly to a friend with irritating bursts of laughter, speciously frank ringing. Golf, fishing, comic operas, ah, the Boeotian. These were the men who monopolized the ethereal divinities. But this brusque separation from his particular divinity was disconcerting. How to see her again? He must go up to Oxford in the morning, he wrote her that night. But if she could possibly let him call during the week, he would manage to run down again. Oh, my dear dreaming poet, she wrote to Oxford, how could you possibly send me a letter to be laid on the breakfast table beside the Times? with a poem in it, too. Fortunately, my husband was in a hurry to get down to the city, and he neglected to read my correspondence. The unchivalrous blackguard, John commented, but what can be expected of a woman-beater? Never, never write to me again at the house. A letter, care of Mrs. Best, 8A Foley Street, W.C., will always find me. She is my maid's mother, and you must not come here either, my dear handsome head in the clouds, except to my at-homes, and then only at judicious intervals. I shall be walking round the pond in Kensington Gardens at four next Wednesday, unless Mrs. Best brings me a letter to the contrary. 
and now thank you for your delicious poem. I do not recognize my humble self in the dainty lines, but I shall always be proud to think I inspired them. Will it be in the new volume? I have never been in print before. It will be a novel sensation. I cannot pay you song for song, only feeling for feeling. O oh, John LaFole, why did we not meet when I had still my girlish dreams? Now I have grown to distrust all men, to fear the brute beneath the cavalier. Mrs. Bess did bring her a letter, but it was not to cancel the appointment, only to say he was not surprised at her horror of the male sex, but that she must beware of false generalizations. Life was still a wonderful and beautiful thing. Vide poem enclosed. He was counting the minutes till Wednesday afternoon. It was surely a popular mistake that only sixty went to the hour. This chronometrical reflection recurred to him even more poignantly in the hour that he circumambulated the pond in Kensington Gardens. Had she forgotten? Had her husband locked her up? What could have happened? It seemed six hundred minutes ere, at ten past five, she came tripping daintily towards him. His brain had been reduced to insanely devising problems for his pupils. If a man walks two strides of one and a half feet a second round a lake fifty acres in area, in how many turns will he overtake a lady who walks half as fast and isn't there? But the moment her pink parasol loomed on the horizon, all his long misery vanished in an effable peace and uplifting. He hurried bareheaded to clasp her little gloved hand. He had forgotten her unpunctuality, nor did she remind him of it. How sweet of you to come all that way, was all she said, and it was a sufficient reward for the hours in the train and the six hundred minutes among the nursemaids and perambulators. The elms were in their glory, the birds were singing briskly, the water sparkled, the sunlit sward stretched fresh and green. It was the loveliest, coolest moment of the afternoon. John instinctively turned down a leafy avenue. Nature and love, what more could poet ask? No, we can't have tea by the kiosk. Mrs. Glamorys protested. Of course, I love anything that savors of Paris, but it's become so fashionable. There will be heaps of people who know me. I suppose you've forgotten it's the height of the season. I know a quiet little place in the high street. She led him, unresisting but bemused, towards the gate and into a confectioner's. Conversation languished on the way. Tea, he was about to instruct the pretty attendant. Strawberry ices, Mrs. Glamorys remarked gently, and some of those nice French cakes. The ice restored his spirits. It was really delicious, and he had got so hot and tired pacing round the pond. Decidedly, Winifred was a practical person, and he was a dreamer. The pastry he dared not touch, being a genius, but he was charmed at the gaiety with which Winifred crammed cake after cake into her rosebud of a mouth. What an enchanting creature! How bravely she covered up her life's tragedy! The thought made him glance at her velvet band. It was broader than ever. He has beaten you again, he murmured furiously. Her joyous eyes saddened. She hung her head, and her fingers crumbled the cake. What is his pretext? he asked, his blood burning. Jealousy, she whispered. His blood lost its glow, ran cold. He felt the bully's blows on his own skin, his romance turning suddenly sordid. But he recovered his courage. He too had muscles. But I thought he just missed seeing me kiss your hand. She opened her eyes wide. It wasn't you, you darling dreamer. He was relieved and disturbed in one. Somebody else, he murmured. Somehow the vision of the player fellow came up. She nodded. Isn't it lucky he has himself drawn a red herring across the track? I didn't mind his blows. You were safe. Then, with one of her adorable transitions, I am dreaming of another ice. 
she cried with roguish wistfulness. I was afraid to confess my own greediness, he said, laughing. He beckoned the waitress. Two more. We haven't got any more strawberries, was her unexpected reply. There's been such a run on them today. Winifred's face grew overcast. Oh, nonsense, she pouted. To John the moment seemed tragic. Won't you have another kind, he queried. He himself liked any kind, but he could scarcely eat a second ice without her. Winifred meditated. Coffee, she queried. The waitress went away and returned with a face as gloomy as Winifred's. It's been such a hot day, she said deprecatingly. There is only one ice in the place, and that's Neapolitan. Well, bring two Neapolitans, John ventured. I mean, there is only one Neapolitan ice left. We'll bring that. I don't really want one. He watched Mrs. Glamoury's daintily devouring the solitary ice, and felt a certain pathos about the party-colored oblong. A something of the haunting sadness of the last rose of summer. It would make a graceful, serio-comic triolet, he was thinking. But at the last spoonful, his beautiful companion dislocated his rhymes by her sudden upspringing. "'Goodness gracious!' she cried. "'How late it is!' "'Oh, you're not leaving me yet,' he said. A world of things sprang into his brain, things that he was going to say, to arrange. They had said nothing, not a word of their love even, nothing but cakes and ices. Poet, she laughed, have you forgotten I live at Hampstead? She picked up her parasol. Put me into a hansom, or my husband will be raving at his lonely dinner table. He was so dazed as to be surprised when the waitress blocked his departure with a bill. When Weirdifrid was spirited away, he remembered she might, without much risk, have given him a lift to Paddington. He hailed another hansom, and caught the next train to Oxford, but he was too late for his own dinner in Hall. Part three, He was kept very busy for the next few days, and could only exchange a passionate letter or two with her. For some time the examination fever had been raging, and in every college poor patients sat with wet towels round their heads. Some, who had neglected their tutor all the term, now strove to absorb his omniscience in a sitting. On the Monday, John Lafalle was good-naturedly giving a special audience to a muscular dunce, trying to explain to him the political effects of the crusades, when there was a knock at the sitting-room door, and the scout ushered in Mrs. Glamorys. She was bewitchingly dressed in white, and stood in the open doorway, smiling, an embodiment of the summer he was neglecting. He rose, but his tongue was paralyzed. The dunce became suddenly important, a symbol of the decorum he had been outraging. His soul, torn so abruptly from history to romance, could not get up the right emotion. Why this imprudence of Winifred's? She had been so careful heretofore. What a lot of books there are on your staircase, she said gaily. He laughed. The spell was broken. Yes, the heap to be cleaned is rather obtrusive, he said. But I suppose it is sort of a tradition. I think I've got hold of the thing pretty well now, sir. The dunce rose and smiled, and his tutor realized how little the dunce had to learn in some things. He felt quite grateful to him. Oh, well, you'll come and see me again after lunch, won't you? If one or two points occur to you for elucidation, he said, feeling vaguely a liar and generally guilty. But when, on the departure of the dunce, Winifred held out her arms, everything fell from him but the sense of the exquisite moment. Their lips met for the first time, but only for an instant. He had scarcely time to realize that this wonderful thing had happened before the mobile creature had darted to his bookshelves and was examining a Thucydides upside down. How clever to know Greek, she exclaimed. And do you really talk it with the other dons? No, we never talk shop, he laughed. But Winifred, what made you come here? I had never seen Oxford. Isn't it beautiful? Nothing's beautiful here, he said, looking round his sober study. No, she admitted, there's nothing I care for here, and had left another celestial kiss on his lips before he knew it. And now you must take me to lunch, and on the river. He stammered, I have work. 
she pouted. But I can't stay beyond tomorrow morning, and I want so much to see all your celebrated oarsmen practicing. You're not staying over the night, he gasped. Yes, I am, and she threw him a dazzling glance. His heart went pit-a-pat. Where, he murmured. Oh, some poky little hotel near the station. The swell hotels are full. He was glad to hear she was not conspicuously quartered. So many people have come down already for Kamen, he said. I suppose they are anxious to see the generals get their degrees. But hadn't we better go somewhere and lunch? They went down the stone staircase, past the battalion of boots, and across the quad. He felt that all the windows were alive with eyes, but she insisted on standing still and admiring their ivied picturesqueness. After lunch, he shamefacedly borrowed the dunce's punt, the necessities of punting, which kept him far from her, and demanded much adroit labor, gradually restored his self-respect, and he was able to look the uncelebrated oarsmen they met in the eyes, except when they were accompanied by their parents and sisters, which subtly made him feel uncomfortable again. But Winifred, piquant under her pink parasol, was singularly at ease, and raptured with the changing beauty of the river, applauding with childish glee the wild flowers on the banks, or the rippling reflections in the water. Look, look, she cried once, pointing skyward. He stared upwards, expecting a balloon at least. But it was only Keats, little rosy cloud, she explained. It was not her fault if he did not find the excursion unreservedly idyllic. How stupid, she reflected, to keep all those nice boys cooped up reading dead languages in a spot made for life and love. I'm afraid they don't disturb the dead languages so much as you think, he reassured her, smiling. And there will be plenty of love-making during Kamen. I am so glad. I suppose there are lots of engagements that week. Oh, yes, but not one per cent come to anything. Really? Oh, how fickle men are. That seemed rather question-begging, but he was so thrilled by the implicit revelation that she could not even imagine feminine inconstancy that he forbore to draw her attention to her inadequate logic. So childish and thoughtless indeed was she that day that nothing would content her but attending a viva, which he had incautiously informed her was public. Nobody will notice us, she urged, with strange unconsciousness of her loveliness. Besides, they don't know I'm not your sister. The Oxford intellect is skeptical, he said, laughingly. It cultivates philosophical doubt. But putting a bold face on the matter, and assuming a fraternal air, he took her to the torture chamber, in which candidates sat dolefully on a row of chairs against the wall, waiting their turn to come before the three grand inquisitors at the table. Fortunately, Winifred and he were the only spectators. But unfortunately, they blundered in at the very moment when the poor owner of the punt was on the rack. The central inquisitor was trying to extract from him information about Beckett, almost prompting him with the very words, but without penetrating through the duncical denseness. John Lafall breathed more freely when the crusades were broached, but alas, it very soon became evident that the dunce had by no means got hold of the thing. As the dunce passed out sadly, obviously ploughed, John Lafall suffered more than he. So conscience-stricken was he that, when he had accompanied Winifred as far as her hotel, he refused her invitation to come in, pleading the compulsoriness of duty and dinner in the hall. But he could not get away without promising to call in during the evening. The prospect of this visit was with him all through dinner, at once tempting and terrifying. Assuredly, there was a skeleton at his feast, as he sat at the high table facing the master. The venerable portraits round the hall seemed to rebuke his romantic waywardness. In the common room he sipped his port uneasily, listening as in a daze to the discussion on free will, which an eminent stranger had stirred up. How academic it seemed, compared with the passionate realities of life! 
but somehow he found himself lingering on at the academic discussion postponing the realities of life every now and then he was impelled to glance at his watch but suddenly murmuring it is very late he pulled himself together and took leave of his learned brethren but in the street the sight of a telegraph office drew his steps to it and almost mechanically he wrote out the message regret detained will call early in morning when he did call in the morning he was told she had gone back to london the night before on receipt of a telegram he turned away with a bitter pang of disappointment and regret part four their subsequent correspondence was only the more amorous the reason she had fled from the hotel she explained that she could not endure the night in those stuffy quarters he consoled himself with the hope of seeing much of her during the long vacation he did see her once at her own reception but this time her husband wandered around the two rooms the cosy corner was impossible and they could only manage to gasp out a few mutual endearments amid the buzz of movement and to arrange a rendezvous for the end of july when the day came he received a heartbroken letter stating that her husband had borne her away to goodwood in a postscript she informed him that quicksilver was a sure thing much correspondence passed without another meeting being effected and he lent her five pounds to pay a debt of honor incurred through her husband's absurd confidence in quicksilver a week later this horsey husband of hers brought her on to brighton for the races there and hither john lafal flew but her husband shadowed her and he could only lift his hat to her as they passed each other on the lawns sometimes he saw her sitting pensively on a chair while her lord and thrasher perused a pink sporting paper such tantalizing proximity raised their correspondence through the hove post office to fever heat life apart they felt was impossible and removed from the sobering influences of his cap and gown, John Lafal dreamed of throwing everything to the winds. His literary reputation had opened out a new career. The Winifred lyrics alone had brought in a tidy sum, and though he had expended that and more on dispatches of flowers and trifles to her, yet he felt this extravagance would become extinguished under daily companionship and the poems provoked by her charms would go far towards their daily maintenance yes he could throw up the university he would rescue her from this bully this gentleman bruiser they would live openly and nobly in the world's eye a poet was not even expected to be conventional she on her side was no less ardent for the great step she raged against the world's law the injustice by which a husband's cruelty was not sufficient ground for divorce but we finer souls must take the law into our own hands she wrote we must teach society that the ethics of a barbarous age are unfitted for our century of enlightenment but somehow the actual time and place of the elopement could never get itself fixed in september her husband dragged her to scotland in october after the pheasants when the dramatic day was actually fixed, Winifred wrote by the next post, deferring it for a week. Even the few actual preliminary meetings they planned for Kensington Gardens or Hampstead Heath rarely came off. He lived in a whirling atmosphere of express letters of excuse and telegrams that transformed the situation from hour to hour. Not that her passion in any way abated, or her romantic resolution really altered it was only that her conception of time and place and ways and means was dizzily mutable but after nigh six months of palpitating negotiations with the adorable mrs glamorys the poet in a moment of dejection penned the prose apothem it is of no use trying to change a changeable person part five but at last she astonished him by a sketch plan of the elopement so detailed even to bandboxes and the paris night route via dieppe 
that no further room for doubt was left in his intoxicated soul, and he was actually further astonished when just as he was putting his handbag into the hansom, a telegram was handed to him saying, Gone to Hamburg, letter follows. He stood still for a moment on the pavement in utter distraction. What did it mean? Had she failed him again? Or was it simply that she had changed the city of refuge from Paris to Hamburg? He was about to name the new station to the cabman, but then, letter follows. Surely that meant he was to wait for it. Perplexed and miserable, he stood with the telegram crumpled up in his fist. What a ridiculous situation! He had wrought himself up to the point of breaking with the world and his past, and now it only remained to satisfy the cabman. He tossed feverishly all night, seeking to soothe himself but really exciting himself the more by a hundred plausible explanations. He was now strung up to such a pitch of uncertainty that he was astonished for the third time when the letter did duly follow. Dearest, it ran. As I explained in my telegram, my husband became suddenly ill. If she had only put that in the telegram, he groaned, and was ordered to Hamburg. Of course it was impossible to leave him in this crisis, for both practical and sentimental reasons. You yourself, darling, would not like me to have aggravated his illness by my flight just at this moment, and thus possibly have his death on my conscience. Darling, you are always right, he said, kissing the letter. Let us possess our souls in patience a little longer. I need not tell you how vexatious it will be to find myself nursing him in Hamburg, out of the season even, instead of the prospect to which I had looked forward with my whole heart and soul. But what can one do? How true is the French proverb, nothing happens but the unexpected. Write to me immediately, post restant, that I may at least console myself with your dear words. The unexpected did indeed happen despite droughts of Elizabeth Brunnen and promenades on the Kerrhaus Terrace, the stalwart woman-beater succumbed to his malady. The curt telegram from Winifred gave no indication of her motions. She sent a reply telegram of sympathy with her trouble. Although he could not pretend to grieve at the sudden providential solution of their life problem, still he did sincerely sympathize with the distress inevitable in connection with the death, especially on foreign soil. He was not able to see her till her husband's body had been brought across the North Sea and committed to the green repose of the old Hampstead churchyard. He found her pathetically altered, her face wan and spiritualized, and all in subtle harmony with the exquisite black gown. In the first interview he dare not speak of their love at all, they discussed the immortality of the soul, and she quoted George Herbert. But with the weeks the question of their future began to force its way back to his lips. We could not decently marry before six months, she said, when definitely confronted with the problem. Six months, he gasped. Well, surely you don't want to outrage everybody, she said, pouting. At first he was outraged himself. What? She who had been ready to flutter the world with a fantastic dance was now measuring her footsteps, but on reflection he saw that Mrs. Glamorys was right once more. Since Providence had been good enough to rescue them, why should they fly in its face? A little more patience and a blameless happiness lay before them. Let him not blind himself to the immense relief he really felt at being spared social obloquy. After all, a poet could be unconventional in his work. He had no need of the practical outlet demanded for the less gifted. Part 6 They scarcely met at all during the next six months. It had, naturally, in this grateful reaction against the recklessness, become a sacred period, even more charged with tremulous emotion than the engagement periods of those who have not so nearly scorched themselves. Even in her presence, he found a certain pleasure in combining distant adoration with the confident expectation of proximity. 
and thus she was restored to the sanctity which she had risked by her former easiness and so all was for the best in the best of all possible worlds when the six months had gone by he came to claim her hand she was quite astonished you promised to marry me at the end of six months he reminded her surely it isn't six months already she said he referred her to the calendar recalled the date of her husband's death you are strangely literal for a poet she said of course i said six months but six months doesn't mean twenty-six weeks by the clock all i meant was that a decent period must intervene but even to myself it seems only yesterday that poor harold was walking beside me in the kerr house park she burst into tears and in the face of them he could not pursue the argument Gradually, after several interviews and letters, it was agreed that they should wait another six months. She is right, he reflected again. We have waited so long, we might as well wait a little longer, and leave malice no handle. The second six months seemed to him much longer than the first. The charm of respectful adoration had lost its novelty, and once again his breast was racked by fitful fevers which could scarcely calm themselves even by conversation into sonnets the one point of repose was that shining fixed star of marriage still smarting under winifred's reproach of his unpoetic literality he did not intend to force her to marry him exactly at the end of the twelve month but he was determined that she should have no later than this exact date for at least naming the day not the most punctilious stickler for convention he felt could deny that mrs gundy's claim had been paid to the last minute the publication of his new volume containing the winifred lyrics had served to color these months of intolerable delay even the reaction of the critics against his poetry that conventional revolt against every second volume that parrot cry of overpraise from the very throats that had praised him though it pained and perplexed him was perhaps really helpful at any rate the long waiting was over at last he felt like jacob after his years of service for rachel the following morning dawned bright and blue and as the towers of oxford were left behind him he recalled that distant saturday when he had first gone down to meet the literary lights of london in his publisher's salon how much older he was now than then and yet how much younger the nebulous melancholy of youth the clouds of philosophy had vanished before this beautiful creature of sunshine whose radiance cut out a clear line for his future through the confusion of life at a florist's in the high street of hampstead he bought a costly bouquet of white flowers and walked airily to the house and rang the bell jubilantly he could scarcely believe his ears when the maid told him her mistress was not at home how dared the girl stare at him so impassively did she not know by what appointment on what errand he had come had he not written to her mistress a week ago that he would present himself that afternoon not at home he gasped but when will she be home i fancy she won't be long she went out an hour ago and has an appointment with her dressmaker at five do you know in what direction she'd have gone oh she generally walks on the heath before tea the world suddenly grew rosy again i will come back again he said yes a walk in this glorious air heathward would do him good as the door shut he remembered he might have left the flowers but he would not ring again and besides it was perhaps better he should present them with his own hand than let her find them on the hall table still it seemed rather awkward to walk about the streets with a bouquet and he was glad accidentally to strike the old hampstead church and to seek a momentary seclusion in passing through its avenue of quiet gravestones on his heathward way mounting the few steps he paused idly a moment on the verge of this green god's acre to read a perpendicular slab on a wall and his face broadened into a smile as he followed the absurdly elaborate biography of a rich self-made merchant who had taught himself to read reader go thou and do likewise was the delicious bull at the end 
As he turned away, the smile still lingering about his lips, he saw a dainty figure tripping down the stony graveyard path, and though he was somehow startled to find her still in black, there was no mistaking Mrs. Glamoury's. She ran to meet him with a glad cry, which filled his eyes with happy tears. "'How good of you to remember,' she said, as she took the bouquet from his unresisting hand, and turned again on her footsteps. He followed her wonderingly, across the uneven road, towards a narrow aisle of graves on the left. In another instant she has stooped before a shining white stone, and laid his bouquet reverently upon it. As he reached her side, he saw that his flowers were almost lost in the vast mass of floral offerings with which the grave of the woman-beater was bestrewn. "'How good of you to remember the anniversary,' she murmured again. "'How could I forget it?' he stammered, astonished. "'Is not this the end of the terrible twelve-month?' The soft gratitude died out of her face. "'Oh, it is that what you were thinking of.' "'What else?' he murmured, pale with conflicting emotions. "'What else? I think decency demanded that this day, at least, should be sacred to his memory. Oh, what brutes men are!' And she burst into tears. His patient breast revolted at last. "'You said he was the brute,' he retorted, outraged. "'Is that your chivalry to the dead? Oh, my poor Harold! My poor Harold!' For once her tears could not extinguish the flame of his anger. "'But you told me he beat you,' he cried. "'And if he did, I dare say I deserved it. Oh, my darling, my darling!' She laid her face on the stone and sobbed. John Lafall stood by in silent torture, as he helplessly watched her white throat swell and fall with the sobs. He was suddenly struck by the absence of the black velvet band the truer mourning she had worn in the lifetime of the so lamented. A faint scar, only perceptible to his conscious eye, added to his painful bewilderment. At last she rose and walked unsteadily forward. He followed her in mute misery. In a moment or two they found themselves on the outskirts of the deserted heath. How beautifully stretched in the gorzy rolling country! The sun was setting in great burning furrows of gold and green, a panorama to take one's breath away. The beauty and peace of nature passed into the poet's soul. "'Forgive me, dearest,' he begged, taking her hand. She drew it away sharply. "'I cannot forgive you. You have shown yourself in your true colors.' Her unreasonableness angered him again. "'What do you mean?' I only came in accordance with our long-standing arrangement. You have put me off long enough. It is fortunate I did put you off long enough to discover what you are. He gasped. He thought of all the weary months of waiting, all the long comedy of telegrams and express letters, the far-off flirtations of the cozy corner, the baffled elopement to Paris. Then you won't marry me? I cannot marry a man I neither love nor respect. You don't love me. Her spontaneous kiss in his sober Oxford study seemed to burn on his angry lips. No, I never loved you. He took her by the arms and turned her round roughly. Look me in the face and dare to say you have never loved me. His memory was buzzing with passionate phrases from her endless letters. They stung like a swarm of bees. The sunset was like blood-red mist before his eyes. "'I have never loved you,' she said obstinately. "'You!' His grasp on her arms tightened. He shook her. "'You are bruising me,' she cried. His grasp fell from her arms as though they were red-hot. He had become a woman-beater. End of The Woman-Beater Recording by Alana Jordan and the United States.